Um, I think I just took a quick glance. If you can confirm, I think we're missing Joy, Christina, and Rob. We are. Let's give them a couple more minutes. Isn't there? Um, isn't there a concert tonight? Yes. Maybe they're trying to get home. <laughs> <laughs> A couple hours before the concert. I don't know if that matters. Oh, I don't know. I'm not keeping up on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest news in Delray this week, Diane? Yes. How do you feel about just starting? And uh, we'll just note when people join the meeting. And if we yeah. come to an agenda item and we don't have a full board, we can then ask the applicant if they wish to move forward or wish to postpone. Okay. All right. Let me start the meeting. One second, please. Fine. All set. All set to go. Well, we can't hear you, Chris. Thank you, Diane. I'd okay. like to call to order the uh, May 17th, 2021 Delray Beach Planning and Zoning Board meeting. Diane, if you would please call the roll. Joy Howell, absent. Alan Zeller. Here. Julian Blankenship. Here. Max Weinberg. Here. Rob Long, absent. Chris Davey. Here. Um, what I'd like I'd like to ask uh, my fellow board members if they would consider uh, amending our agenda for this evening um, and changing the order of some of the items. I think that um, it makes sense to take item eight and move it to become item seven and take items seven a and b and make them eight a and b i'm agreeable to that chris you would be agreeable to that yeah thank you i think it makes sense I mean. i'm That'd trying to do it with, i just want everybody to understand i'm trying to do this so that staff can finish their presentations and get home and try to get the quickest presentations done the done earlier in our meeting so um at any rate if i could if somebody would offer a motion um for an amended agenda that would be great uh, i so move <laughs> oh there's joy hello there all right i'll second, second that motion <laughs> I'll, I'll second it <laughs> I'll leave it to you to discern who seconded and who made the motion. We'll put it down as Julian with the motion, and I heard Alan Zeller as a second. I think it was Joy with the motion. But it was close. <laughs> um, you can have it, Julian. It's okay. <laughs> um, anyway, all in favor, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Great, the eyes have it. Can um, just, um, Chris, can we just say, um, so Julian made the motion? Yes, Julian made the motion, and it was seconded by Mr. Zeller. Okay, thank you. 
is the way I remember it. Um, and if we've already voted in favor of that, um, what I would suggest is Chris, you're muted. At any rate, sorry. When I leave this screen, the space bar doesn't work anymore. My bad. Um, at any rate, uh, if we could move on, and does anybody has everybody had an opportunity to read the minutes? That we're I'm waiting on Mr. Zeller. Before I say that I read the minutes, I'll, I'll wait for Mr. Zeller. <laughs> Mr. Zeller, have you read the minutes? <laughs> I read the minutes. Okay. I'll, I make a motion to approve the minutes. Can we do them both together? I believe they have to be done separately, but I'll ask Mr. Bennett. Okay. He's in the background. So, yeah, if nobody has any changes, you could do them together. It's fine. That would be perfect, okay. Mr. Zeller. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from the February 22nd, 2021 meeting and the March 15th, 2021 meeting. So, second. so moved by Mr. Zeller, second. Second. Great, second, and Diane, that would be um, all in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Okay. Um, with that, Diane, even though it's early in the meeting this evening, do you want to swear in the members of the public? Do you want to swear in um, staff and the applicants now, or would you rather wait until we come into the quasi judicial items? William, what should we do? I usually we um, yeah. read the quasi and everything first. We'll we'll wait to swear in until each individual item, just because some applicants use the podium room, so not all the applicants will be on camera. So we can wait for each item. And I see Mr. Long is here. Great. Okay, so now we're Sorry. only missing one person. Is that correct, Diane? Yeah, and I think I'm going to give her a call. That would be wonderful. Um, perfect. Uh, so. Let's see, we can then move on to, do we have, I'm assuming we don't, but Diane, do we have any comments from the public this evening on non-agenda items? No, we do not. Okay, we do not. Um, and with that being said, let me, um, I can read the quasi-judicial hearing rules when we get to those items. Um, there's really no reason to do them now. So what I'd like to do now would be move on to item 7a which would be the green building requirements file number 2020-150 ms alvarez <laughs> i'm getting there all right okay uh okay good evening board uh thank you for moving the green building requirements up to the beginning of the agenda that doesn't necessarily help me because i'll be here all night with you all, but um, our sustainability officer, Kent Edwards, is on the meeting with us, and so I'm certainly much appreciates it. So this uh, this item is our um, green building requirements, providing recommendations to the City Commission on Ordinance 1621. And um, like I said, our sustainability officer is here, and he will ex go through, through the item, the history of green building in Delray, and um, some other items, and then I'll I'll join back at towards the end of the presentation. So Kent, if you would like to go ahead. Okay, thank you, Amy, and thank you, board members. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you uh, about the green building ordinance. Uh, first of all, some uh, background going back to 2009. A uh, community group actually organized and, and put together a green task force report which they presented to the the commission uh, the commission supported it and actually started the uh, green board what now is called the green implementation advancement board in in 2010. there were uh, a tremendous number of excellent recommendations in the green task force report one of those was to increase the amount of green building in the city of delray beach 
And in 2015, there was a regulation that was passed just applying to the central business district of uh, buildings, 50,000 square feet or more uh, must reach a, a silver level. On the next slide, um, there uh, in 2019, the Green Board made additional recommendations that uh, this regulation be revised to apply to the whole city and to apply to buildings of 5,000 square feet and, and larger. And at the gold lead or equivalent certification level, so um, uh, that was taken to the commission and the commission uh, supported it. Um, also, I'd say in, in 2020, the comp plan uh, amendment was passed and there were are many sections in the comp plan that support green building as seen on the next slide. I'm trying. Uh, these uh, actually the previous one that there you go. So uh, overall, the um, land development regulations uh, require that any amendment to the LDR must meet the goals, objectives and policies of, of the comprehensive plan. Here you see uh, three different policies in three different sections that pertain to uh, resilient and sustainable construction it, it really is a very broad uh, principle that that it is is seen uh, throughout and so we think that this ordinance draft ordinance is consistent with uh, with the, the comp plan and on the next slide so some of the details in uh, this regulation why are we doing it um, generally promote sustainable development and why do we want to do that? Um, not just because it's nice, not just because it's green, but I, I look at at, uh, at this green building and it's efficient. It is uh, the kind of construction that uses materials that are, are sustainable. It is built in a way that uses less energy, uh, creates less waste, and ultimately it's a very good business model, although it may take some change, uh, still the efficiency uh, of, of this kind of construction is, is really a, a main, main principle. So wh uh, what, are, what kind of construction are we talking about? This is new construction and additions of 5,000 square feet on any kind of uh, development. It would be public, so the city of Delray Beach, the county buildings would be subject to this private development, whether it's residential or commercial, would, would also be subject to this. And that 5,000 square feet is on one or more buildings on a single parcel or in a unified uh, development, and if it's being developed together, that 5,000 square feet. And what kind of requirements are, are included in the, in the draft ordinance? Um, it would be a certification level of gold, or equivalent to the lead. So there is not just the lead uh, certification out there. There's the Green Globe, there's FGBC, and, and there are others. So, and we have gotten comments that some are more appropriate for different kinds of construction. So we really leave it up to the, the developer to, to pick the one that works for them. Um, the requirement also would apply to the city. So any contracts that, that we have, we would need to have a, a facilitator on board. Um, on the next slide, the actual process requirements are pretty simple. Uh, two main steps. One, at the time of building permit submittal, proof of registration with the certifying agency, a affidavit from a credentialed professional with that certifying uh, agency, and a scorecard or checklist it's referred to in, in different ones showing the anticipated credits that they uh, intend to to reach and that's all that's required at the time of a permit application the other main step is uh, prior to a certificate of occupancy so when uh, coming in for co 
if the uh, gold level or equivalent certification has been reached, then uh, documentation of, of that from the certifying agency would be submitted and, and that would be the end of, of the process if successful. That probably is going to be pretty rare that they would have gotten through the, the certifying steps. So um, there is a bond that can be posted. There's a sliding scale uh, depending on the size of the construction. So at 5,000 to 25,000 square feet of construction, it's a 3% bond at 25 to 75 it's a four percent 75 to 150,000 square feet is five and over 150,000 is six percent and then um, after a year or during that time if they reach certification um, and then of course they get the full bond back if they get more than half of the points for the certification, then they would get a portion of the bond back. For example, um, at lead gold requires a minimum of 60 points. So if 40 points were uh, obtained, then they would get two thirds of, of their bond back. If less than half of the points required for certification were obtained, then the full bond would, would be forfeit. In the uh, draft ordinance, there is a, a new definition, and that is for a sustainability and resilience fund. So uh, if any funds are uh, obtained from bond forfeiture, then they would go into this fund that the city will use uh, towards sustainable and resilient projects, whether it be planting trees or putting in solar panels or uh, EV structure, all, all kinds of uh, different sustainable and, and resilient projects could could receive those types of funds. And there's a provision for reevaluation of the green building ordinance in, in three years to improve it or do whatever needs to be done in order to make sure it works. So you, you uh, probably are familiar with green building programs. This is really just an example uh, to, to show that there are many different areas where points can be uh, obtained. Each of the different uh, certifying agencies has a little bit different spin, but the bottom line is um, ways of saving energy, saving water, uh, using sustainable materials, reducing waste, those types of things are, are going to score points. And um, as as businesses become more familiar with this, the studies have shown that the costs associated with going through these programs are uh, become less and less. So on the next slide. So what are the benefits of, of green building? I, I mentioned uh, efficiency uh, before the reduction in use of energy and, and resources. There's also a market that is developing where for commercial purposes, especially for developers that are going to retain ownership of a building, there is operation and, and maintenance uh, benefits, cost benefits to having a, a green building because they use less energy, they, they use less water. They're built to require less, less maintenance. So there is uh, definitely a value added component and a growing market that recognizes that. There's also health benefits and productivity benefits. Studies have shown that uh, workers in green buildings are more productive, they're more healthy, there can be better morale, and things like natural sunlight due to the outdoors, uh, designed to encourage walking around and being more active. Uh, so it, it makes sense that green buildings would, would be better for businesses in, in that way. And I also mentioned the life cycle cost where um, even in those instances where a green building costs more and those are becoming uh, less and less uh, because of the operational and, and maintenance benefits, um, you can actually have 20% less over the, the life cycle cost in, in a green building. So I, I kind of have touched on this downside um, item at the bottom, there is a, a perception of additional cost of construction and that that can be a reality, especially uh, 10 years ago or so there were there were several studies that reported this and certainly the first time through for business 
um, in a new system, there, there's going to be uh, a learning curve there. Um, but studies are also showing that those costs of construction are evening out. And going forward, I, I would really say that there's going to be less and less of, of a difference between as, as businesses, construction and materials all become uh, more familiar and, and more available. There is still the cost of, of certification, though, for, for the program. OK, on the next slide. So uh, right now, even though there's only a requirement for the central business district uh, of 50,000 square feet to have green buildings, uh, there are many other green buildings that are in Delray Beach already. You see uh, those that have CBD within Parentheses, those are the ones that are required already. But as you look at that left hand column, I would point out uh, the TD Bank and the PNC Bank. I mean, these are business organizations that are going to understand the, the bottom line and they have invested in green building. So I, I think that that's an indicator of how economically viable uh, green buildings can be. It's also Spodak Dental. So there's a Healthcare organization there, and and again other other businesses that are going to watch the bottom line like Starbucks and the Delray Preserve. So um, I think that this is a way of the future, and you know it it is important for Delray Beach to to improve the the green building ordinance that we have. And uh, the next slide, there are several other uh, municipalities that have a green building ordinance in place. The use of a requirement is in a, a smaller number of, of those. So Coconut Creek, Coral Gables, Miami Beach, and Jupiter being some that are closest uh, to us. Some of them use a, a square foot threshold. Some of them apply it to uh, all types of development, but uh, they, they can use a, a lower level of, of certification. Our neighboring uh, cities, Boynton Beach, encourages green building, but there is a fee, uh, a small percent, but a fee imposed on all construction uh, that then goes towards sustainability issues. And Boca Raton has the requirement in their comp plan, but they are looking at into uh, what would be in their green building ordinance. I'll also point out uh, that there is a Florida statute now, 255.2575, that applies to all government buildings, that there will be a level of green certification for all government buildings. And uh, to me, this really indicates that this is becoming more and more widespread. Consultants, architects, engineers are going to be more and more familiar with the, the green building requirements and the systems. And so the, the learning curve is, is going to is going to reach the point where it, where it levels off. And there will be many more contractors out there and, and costs will even come down more. The incentive programs are, are really all over the board uh, from development incentives to refunds on uh, permit fees. So there's really a large variety of ordinance that are already out there. On the next slide. So uh, once again, the uh, ordinance that's proposed is uh, consistent with the comp plan and uh, the housing component I, I mentioned before, and, but also coastal management and neighborhoods, uh, districts and, and corridors. Um, this is just one example of increasing resilience. There are many, many requirements, especially in the NDC portion uh, that encourage uh, location and uh, transportation and all kinds of other items that get credit in in, in the various uh, certifying agencies. So this would uh, this ordinance would be very consistent with many different portions of the comp plan. And with that, Amy's going to give a little more uh, background and take it from here. So uh, thank you, Ken. We've taken this ordinance to all of our advisory boards in the city and the Green Board, of course, supported the amendments as proposed uh, earlier this year. The DDA reviewed the amendments in April 
and they weren't supported as proposed. Uh, they did express some concerns with the uh, change in the CBD going from 50,000 down to 5,000 and then um, increasing the threshold from silver to gold. Um, but they thought maybe the requirement should be phased and, and perhaps maybe um, obtain some more stakeholder input. Um, Pineapple Grove did uh, support the uh, amendments as proposed, as did the Chamber of Commerce Advisory Government Affairs Group. The uh, Site Plan Review and Appearance Board, they, they reviewed the amendments. Now, they don't make recommendations, um, but we did want to obtain their input as they would be uh, reviewing most of the projects that would uh, fall under this requirement. And they were supportive of the ordinance. They did express some concerns regarding the added expense to single family residences and smaller development. And they, they talked maybe there was a need for some incentives or benefits and to lower the, um, the minimum certification level. The HPB reviewed these earlier this month. They did recommend approval. Uh, and their recommendation is of approval to the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, however, they did make some modifications in their motion, and that was that the minimum level um, be reduced from gold, which is proposed, to either just the minimum certification or silver for lead, and um, that they also recommended that incentives be provided to achieve a higher certification. So incentives to maybe get to that gold or plat platinum level and also consider to that the city should consider the need to phase to a higher level um, when we look at this again at the three-year review so we're with you tonight and then we are um anticipating the ordinance to go before the city commission for first reading in june and then of course we have your uh, board actions but um I guess it's now for board discussion, and Kent and I are here and available for any uh, questions that you might have. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you very much. Thank you also, Mr. Edwards. Um, presentation was spot on. Um, can I ask my colleagues on the board do who would like to start? Does anybody have any questions of staff, either Ms. Edwards or Ms. Alvarez? I have just a couple of questions. Sure, Mr. Uh, Zeller, go ahead, please. The three year review, what would that involve? Uh, I'm sorry, you, you broke up a little bit. Could you repeat that, please? Okay. The three-year review, the proposed three-year review, what would that involve? Okay. Uh, that would be a absolute coverage re review. Um, it could entail anything from repeal of the ordinance to uh, looking at specifics that, that were not functioning as intended. Um, so, so really that three year time frame just uh, is a requirement that we would come back and, and take a look and address whatever concerns or leave it as is. Okay. I, um, but in my view, it, it appears that this has gone on or been discussed for a very long time, as you pointed out. Um, and I would hate to see after assuming that this is approved again by the by the commissioners i would hate to see that it come up for debate to repeal it after only three years i don't know that that's that's um, a significant amount of time to really get get an impression of what the benefits of the of the or lead programs involved. The other question that I had was in, in the ordinance itself, the um, in section 
five. Yes, it is. It's on page on page eight, number four, where it says in lieu of the required bond, the city shall place the equivalent of the bond amount into the sustainability and resilience fund. So it's this is the the money that they get from the developer. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that section is just for the city of Delray Beach. Okay, so the, so that presumes that the city already would have the money from the developer, correct? Um, well, actually. Which, uh, which section was that again? Five. Well, section five. Just it's in the paragraph just above section six. Okay. That. Um, yes, it, it says in lieu of the required bond, the city. So that's for city uh, construction because this this ordinance does also apply to the city of Delray Beach and for our own buildings. So rather than the city giving a bond to the city, it's just saying that that we, Delray Beach, will will pay money into the fund. Okay. All right. I didn't I didn't realize that that section only applied to the city. I thought it was the city holding the developer's bond instead. Okay. Yeah, the the sections right. above that uh, apply to the. The, the bond that's held by the city for other development. Okay. And would this ordinance as it's as it's prepared ensure that the obligations for the developers to to comply and to post the bond apply both to the applicant who's making the application and the ultimate developer who builds it? In other words, their successors and in interest if if the building uh, plans are flipped to somebody else. I I believe it would. I mean, there there is a, some legal interpretation there, so I don't want to step outside of my line. But the the intent is that at uh, time of certificate of occupancy, that the bond is required. So. There isn't a hard stop on use of, of the building, but there is a hard deadline for when the bond will be obtained. And there's also a hard deadline for a decision on when a portion of the bond would be forfeit. And that's one year uh, after that. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all the questions that I have. But Mr. Chairman, I, I fully support this ordinance. I think is very critical and I think it's long overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, I have a question of, of Mr. Edwards, Max. Mr. Weinberg, please go ahead. If I could present a scenario that's based on on the, the documentation I've read here. Say someone has a, a 2,000 square foot 1950s ranch house and they want to add uh, an addition and they can based on their setbacks and other requirements, and it brings it above 5,000 square feet. Is that retroactive to the entire building or does the 5,000 square foot uh, minimum uh, kick in on new, 5,000 square feet of new building? It, it is new building. So it would be a new footprint of 5,000 square foot um, a completely new structure or in addition, um, the addition footprint of 5,000 square feet. So in, in your scenario where you have a, a 2,000 square foot ranch and you're expanding 3,500 square feet on, onto that, that, that would not be covered by this ordinance. That would not be covered. Thank you. And the, um, uh, this is, when enacted, this would be a requirement and not an option. So in other words, you have a year, once you're living in the building, if you're the individual or if a year from purchasing it and uh, to bring it into compliance if it's not, by various methods. Correct. Or the bond 
would be accurate for them. So when you move in, then you post the bond based on the the actual construction cost or the, I'm a little unclear about the uh, the mechanics of the bond. Uh, sure. uh, it, it, um, it's based on the on the invoices or, or projection or the permits that you've pulled and paid for? How does that work? Um, it is not spelled out in great detail in, in the ordinance. So we are looking to the, the development community to, to provide that cost to us. In the uh, permit application documents, there is a cost that is cited though. So this is a precedent that, that is out there because the permit fee is based on the, the cost of construction. So we would use that cost of, of construction um, in order to base the bond also and it's the time of application for CO. So there wouldn't be move in and then get the bond. You would have to have the bond um, in order to get the CO. Right. So I'm clear. The, uh, it's 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 really an estimate uh, that the developer or if the developer is a, a single homeowner. Uh, it's an estimate of what they think this project will cost. The fee is based on the permit fee is based on that. It could be less. It could be could be a lot more. Uh, permits that were issued, for example, six months ago based on uh, X are now generally three times X in terms of the execution of the work uh, for a number of reasons. So that's basically TBD. Uh, I, I mean, it could be TBD, but I, I would say that we're trying to make it an ordinance. Um, and, and I think that it's successful. This is one of the most straightforward ordinances that I have read. It is pretty simple uh, to follow. It is pretty tight. Um, yes, there is some trust that is involved there, but I mean, there's, I think, if you're going to get into the accounting and the construction project, then that's going to be uh, some staff time that that I don't think that was anticipated with this. So, is there room for for someone to not be honest? Uh, maybe, um, but we do already take the cost of construction at, at other steps. So, I, I I think that that's appropriate, and I would also say. The incentive that we want here is for developers to get the whole bond back. We want green building to occur. I mean, there, there are comments that, well, you're taking a bond from someone and that's going to discourage development. Well, we don't want to discourage development. We want to encourage green development. So we really want that bond to be fully given back and released. So it's a it's a uh, incentive for the developer at whatever level to uh, uh, to comply with green building, which I'm totally in favor of. It is, and and I'd also say that it, it kind of levels the playing field because there are uh, construction businesses out there that are, are not going to want to do green buildings. There is a mechanism for those developers to go forward. They pay the bond in a year down the road. They had no intent and they, uh, you know, they give up the bond. Okay, so there is a way for those kinds of businesses to go forward. That's not what we're trying to encourage you. I see. And one other question, under the, uh, the bond, if it's forfeited and it goes into the fund of sustainability, does that sustainability encompass other programs that currently exist? Uh, as you said, I think you mentioned that the tree, the tree funding, so-called sapling fund, is it, does it apply to that? It, it could. The, the fund uh, will be overseen by my office, and I, I do see sustainability not as being a standalone program like utilities or parks or fleet, right? Sustainability 
uh, to me, is more like human resources or safety. We're a part of all aspects. Actually, in a healthy organization, it is a part of all aspects. So any efficiency measures, any insulation improvements, air conditioning improvements, uh, solar panel installations, electric vehicle, tree planting, uh, dune management, just the, the whole array of projects. Uh, and I'm really hoping, well, first of all, I would hope that not a penny goes into that. That really is my first hope because then we'll be getting green development. For those funds that go in to there, I, I really hope that we can use that to work with the other departments and come up with some great projects that further sustainability and, and speak up. Okay, thank you. I just have one other question of, I guess, uh, Ms. Alvarez. Uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but the difference in the alternative actions between, what is the difference between A and B? So, uh, B would be, um, is that the one that's as amended? Yes, that's the only difference is yes, there it is. one amends, so, the other is amended. Right, so if the board's recommendation was, for example, the same that the historic board had, so they amended it um, and said, you know, let's not have gold as the minimum. And they said certification or silver as the minimum. So they made some some modifications. They made a recommendation to include modifications to amend the ordinance as written. So that's what that would be. So if you all have alternative language that you would like to include, uh, B would be the option that you would look at. OK, thank you. Mr. Davey, Ms. Blankenship, you're up. Thank you. I'll be I'll be brief. Um, I, I do think that the that it's a good program. My only concern is it's not so much the developer and the commercial um, aspect of it, but the residential uh, aspect. And I just I'm concerned about five thousand square feet being. It sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot. And if I'm a single family um, residential construction person that's going to just build a family home someplace. Um, I just don't think it it might put an undue burden on, on someone like that. And so that would be my concern is that it's a it's a just a gold level. Now um, I don't know what it would what it would take to maybe just do the tier aspect of it where maybe a residential could apply for um, like with silver or something like that, if that would be more appropriate for what they have. So maybe a, a tiered approach for, for as, as in terms of square footage. Um, uh, otherwise, I mean, that's really, I guess, my, my biggest concern um, would be that and maybe some sort of incentivizing program where we they are recognized somehow within the city to encourage them not to just say, oh, we'll pay the bonds, like an in lieu fee for parking or something to that, to that right. effect. We'll just pay the bond and you know, no big deal. We won't do it. We, we can afford to pay it. It's no big deal. So maybe if there's some other way that we can incentivize it or give them, you know, the recognition or really make a, a big deal about them to the city. I'm not sure how, how that works, but um, I guess those would be, all be my concerns at the moment for that. Just the residential aspect of it. And then just, I, you know, we see what happens with trees. People pay the and fee. It's done. Um, yep. and they, they don't really worry about it. So that would be my concern. And also maybe um, what the money will be used for in the fund. I mean, I know that's not spelled out, but I can see that becoming potentially problematic in the future. So those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Blankenship. And actually, that's actually a good time. I'd just like to chime in after you, Julian, and echo your sentiments, if you don't mind. Um, I just wanted to say my concern in this ordinance is the 5,000 square foot lower level and the gold standard. Um, I mean, I got to say that I'm in the real estate consulting business and the numbers that have been coming in for construction for me since the beginning of this year are absolutely off the charts like the cost of lumber is up 65 percent i mean it's it's just absolutely unbelievable 
And like you said, I am really not in favor of putting at this point in time, maybe three years from now, we'll be in a different cycle with inflation and everything else. But right now, costs are are increasing so much in the construction industry. Do I want to burden somebody who's building a single family home in the Lake Ida neighborhood or elsewhere in this city with additional costs that due to the supply chain issues could be quite significant right now? So um, I just like to say, and I'll give it to the rest of the board, but I wanted to echo what you said, Juan. Um, you know, this would have my support if we moved it to something like 15,000 square feet and lead silver and let us look at it, um, you know, three years from now. But I think that especially right now coming out of COVID, 50% of the houses in this country right now are selling above the offering price. Okay. It's just, it's a ferocious market. And I don't know if we, when we look at the towns that are around us, nobody else who we're in competition with, whether it's Boca or Boynton or anybody else, is putting this type of cost on the single family builder or the single family homeowner. So just wanted to say my piece and uh, would ever like to add their comments, please let me know who'd like to speak. The chairman, I would like to add to that and also echo your comments and Ms. Blankenship's comments that perhaps there's a mechanism that could be put in place to dissolve the linkage between commercial development and single family residential development where on single family residential development, the burden to meet the same standard would be greater in financial terms, particularly with the statistics that you just cited, which are accurate. Uh, the the uh, is there a way also to institute a mechanism to have a you know you're going from fifty thousand square feet to five thousand square feet? Is there a middle ground that can be reached? One for commercial, one for residential. Maybe res as the Blankenship said, five thousand square feet does sound like a lot, but it's in reality it's smaller than it uh, than it sounds. If you, I was just going to say, Mr. Weinberg, you're doing a project now shortly, and I'm sure the numbers that you're hearing are a far cry from what you might have thought two years ago. And I think that we have to find some way to kind of, we don't want to burden the person who's building one or two homes and add significantly to that cost as we're coming out of this COVID situation. And I think that as you said, from 50,000 to 5,000, to me, it seemed like maybe we set it at 15. But um, listen, I've had my say, Mr. Weinberg, you had yours. I appreciated hearing everything you said. I know, uh, excuse me, Ms. Morrison wants to jump in here. I just want to let her um, express her thoughts to, to this conversation. Ms. Morrison, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Kent, for continuing to um, attempt to drag us into the 21st century here in Delray Beach. Your efforts are most appreciated as always. Um, just want to make sure the board understands that Delray Beach is in the midst of getting many trophy developments. We have a, a wonderful reputation in our city. Um, we're bringing trophy properties like the Ray, the Market, the Tiger Woods Golf Center. There's great things coming on Congress Avenue. And we want to keep attracting that type of trophy property development and implementing um, green uh, incentives uh, or programs like this won't stop the trophies. Um, I share your concern with single families. Uh, with the burden it might place on a single family home. And maybe that could be switched a little bit. But if we want to keep attracting um, the top developments, I think something like this is very forward thinking. So thank you, Kent. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kent and Amy, that this is only on new construction. This does not kick in if there's a resale event. That is correct, right? Yes, it, it's new construction only, either uh, new footprint or addition. Right. 
So it's not going to kick into resales and things like that. It's only new construction. Um, and it will be, it won't be a flipping of the switch implementing this program. It will be phased in. Is that correct? Uh, it, it could be. I mean, that, that's a, another comment. We do not have a, a phasing time frame in there, but we, we did discuss that. And there are certainly other ordinances that have had a, a time frame phasing. We may want to consider phasing in with, um, incentives to start and then a year later go to silver and then look at it again and go to gold after that. But to just flip a switch and implement it, Chris is absolutely right that um, that could be, create hardship on some properties. So um, uh, your consideration of those things would, would be helpful. Um, I'm mean, also in favor of, of maybe moving to silver uh, for smaller development and residential and easing into the into the gold. Um, that that would help us a great deal too. So thank you. Thank Mr. you, Ms. Chair. Larson. Mr. Long. Mr. So uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, thanks uh, to Kent and um, I think that the boards have some really great comments on this. Um, I was actually on the Green Implementation Advancement Board like five years ago, working on this back then. So I'm actually uh, really grateful that I, I get a chance to vote on it today. It feels like it's kind of come full circle. And I feel like Delray has kind of become known for, for making bold moves when it comes to sustainability. And this is certainly uh, in that vein. And I would love to see the most robust version of this uh, get passed, but I think the boards made some excellent points about uh, the hardship that could create, especially uh, with residential homes being built. And given the, the, the circumstances and just how astronomical building prices and the price of lumber is and stuff like that right now, I think a phased in approach that's been suggested probably makes the most sense as much as it hurts me to even water this down a little bit. That, that probably is a smart reality to avoid a lot of blowback with this so it gets a positive reception and then we can gradually step it up to where it needs to be so i i agree with the assessment that the, the board seems to have come to as well and i really think this is an exciting thing and um which should, it's very it's a big deal so thanks everyone thank you mr long ms howell thank you mr chair uh, i would actually support this ordinance um with some sort of a provision perhaps that might um, allow for an applicant to file for some hardship. Um, I think we we have not only a climate change issue in this country, I, I believe it's a climate crisis. And I believe the federal government is putting in some pretty aggressive, um, you know, initiatives right now trying to really turn things around by 2030, which which really is only nine years away. So I, I think this is a great ordinance and I really, um, I wanna thank you uh, on the staff for coming forward with it and, and I'll support it. Thank you, Ms. Howell. Okay, um, I think uh, everybody's had the opportunity to uh, share their thoughts on this. Um, I think we've heard some divergent views, but I think there's probably a consensus here on the board to, um, it seems to me, uh, to amend this in some way to, for lack of a better term, protect um, protect uh, the single family builder and the single family home purchaser, um, offer them, and especially since this is going to be revisited in the next three years, Three years flies by, and I think that at that time it might make sense, or even in two years, um, to come back and move it to gold. But as I said, from my perspective, I think that um, Ms. Morrison made an excellent point that the premier projects are not going to be put off by this sort of, of amendment. If you're coming in here and you're looking to build the Ray, the Del Rey Marketplace, the Seagate Hotel, or one of these other projects that are a huge investment in town. Um, it's not a, a discouraging factor for them for the most part because they can absorb it and potentially write it off in other different ways. But 
for your single family homeowner or your single family builder um, who maybe just has a small company, this could be quite difficult. And if we exempt them from it by increasing the square footage in two or three years, the city commission or the board at that time can come back and look at this and you know lower it maybe at that point it'll make sense to go from 15,000 to 3,500 square feet who knows um but at any rate I think everybody's had their say um does somebody want to give a motion a shot I'll give it a shot Chris if you don't mind is that Ms. Blankenship of course please and go ahead thank you uh, a recommend approval to the city commission of ordinance number 16-21 as amended amending the land development regulations for the purpose of requiring that all new construction over 5,000 square feet whether public or private obtain leadership and energy and environmental design certification of minimum gold level or the equivalent of a nationally recognized certification standard by finding that the amendment as amended and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in land development regulations. Um, how do you want me to state the amendment? Is, is that something that Amy could just uh, convey to the commission or would you like to be specific? I guess that's my question. Hang on, I'm Mr. Bennett. To get my... <laughs> So I can I can type as you all talk to craft the language. I the mean, amendments that you'd like. To me, it seems to me it just seems like the simplest thing is take the uh, motion that Ms. Blankenship read, um, number A, and just change it to like let's say fifteen thousand square feet and silver lead. Might be That's one way to might be one way to handle it. I'm not saying we have to handle it that way. I'm just throwing it out there as a suggestion. Well, what, what we could do is, Julian, if you want to make a motion adopting some type of amendments, and then we can get a second in discussion. For discussion. OK, and that's fine. we work on mm -hmm. you know, what there's a consensus for on square feet or silver over gold and so forth. Thank okay. you, Mr. Bennett. Great idea. Uh, so. Um, the motion stands as read with the amendments, including uh, 15,000 uh, square feet minimum. Um, the and we'll, let's go from there. If I can get a second for discussion, then we can discuss the other. Do I have a second for the purposes of discussion? I second that. Mr. Weinberg, second. Um, so now we can enter, please. Everybody just, Julian, feel free. <laughs> It's your um, it's your motion, so. Yeah, so I have a question. Go ahead. Sure, Ms. Um, let me just under, make sure I understand. When you say all new construction over 15,000 square feet, are you talking about per unit? Uh, in other words, in other words, the way the ordinance is drafted, that would be 15,000 square feet of construction on an individual parcel right okay, okay. Um, so that's going to take that's going to take probably everything from your small commercial but building up right okay i just was thinking i you know how many how many residential homes are over five thousand square feet lots more than <laughs> lots <laughs> more than you think. And, and i like the language that we we're putting it out of square foot it's sort of like completely excluding residential or I think that that's complicated. I think that we, we raise the threshold of the square footage, then that's a little bit more simplistic and easier to understand in the ordinance overall. That's just my view on it. Um, I think it gets more complex when we try and have two separate things for residential and commercial. So I like how it's 15,000 square feet or over. Um, any other comments or things that we would like yeah. to also uh, add in there? Uh, uh, Ms. Blanks, I have a comment. If you're building, if you're contemplating building a 15,000 square foot house, uh, single family residence, the bond is not going to be an issue. Right. <laughs> and, Agreed. Uh, so, you know, 5,000, there's a, there's a, there's a wide gulf of the, of the, uh, uh, cons uh, the, the population who's going to fall between five and 15,000. So maybe it, you know, especially, especially, and I think the difference, 
Well, I, think I just want to interject, that. Mr. Weinberg. I just want to say the way yes. governments down here calculate square footage, they include things like covered patios and what have you in the calculation of the square foot in addition to garages. So it's not like we're really talking about living, heated, and cooled square footage here. <laughs> right. It's uh, under air, generally. Correct? Exactly. So a 15,000 square foot house under air, that's a big house by anybody's definition. Uh, but a 5,000 square feet with a thousand foot covered patio and a three car garage is not that big. <laughs> it's not that big. That's right. So my, it's my feeling that the threshold should be increased, but I think the demographic that exists between five, the, demo, the, the constituency of people building between five and 15, that's where the burden is going to be. 15,000 and up is going to be less of a burden to post the bond. Uh, and many of these practices in terms of uh, lead are instituted anyway. Right. Uh, but I, it's, I'll it's, just give you, for instance, what, what I was really thinking about here, not just the single family homeowner. Um, and I, I don't mean to digress, but I just want to throw this out. We had those two young gentlemen who came in for the townhouse approvals a number of months back. You remember them? They were over in Tropic Isle. Yep. Okay. And they were trying to build like, let's say five townhomes, I believe what was the project. Okay. So at the price point they're at, they're probably just under 15,000 square feet for that entire project. And I'm not looking to, let's say, handicap somebody with the burdens of this who are building townhomes that are going to be sold for, you know, $450,000 or $500,000. Or well, Mr. Chair, that was my question. I, I thought you meant per unit, and certainly those townhomes were a lot less. I'm, I don't even think they were 5,000 square feet each. No, they were they? About, they're probably about 2,500, including the garages right. and everything. But you have five yeah. of them. Now, all of a sudden, you're at 12 five. Yeah, but that was my question to you. If Are you talking about an aggregate, or are you talking about yes, the individual aggregate. units? No, I'm talking about an aggregate, because that's the way the ordinance is written. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Edwards. Uh, yes, if I if I could be recognized, I can clarify Please. it a, a little Please. bit. So the the term that's used in the ordinance for the square footage is gross floor area. Okay. So, and that specifically refers to basically what's under air. So okay. patios, garages would would not be in, included in in that. But <laughs> But Mr. Edwards, is that one? Is that is that per unit, or is that an aggregate? If you if you have a multifamily development. Okay, so I, I wanted to make sure that y'all are clear on on that under air issue. Now, as far as aggregate goes, yeah, it it does address the ordinance does address development. So on one or two parcels as a unified development. So if you had three parcels that were coming in as a development for single family residences and each of them were 1,700 square feet. And we come in at 5,100 and that would trip to 5,000 the way it is written now. Or if you had one parcel that had a 3,500 square foot home and a 2,000 square foot cottage, then that would trip the 5,000 because they're separate buildings, but it's on one parcel. Mm -hmm. parcel. Well, well, would it make any sense to do it um, per unit? No, because, because the simple fact is, is that multifamily, the, the proper way to look at this is per construction on an individual building lot, okay, or on a project. And that's why what I'm saying is that that's why, in my own opinion, moving the needle up to 15,000 square feet, at least for the next three years. And by three years from now, we may be in a situation, as I said, where we put it down to 3,500. But for right now, I think that 15,000 is really, um, because I don't think any of us would want to be saddling, you know, those two brothers who came in here, that type of construction 
with this type of acquire, <laughs> or at least I don't. <laughs> but so, what would that mean for the for the homeowner that's doing a custom build or someone doing a custom build? If are you saying they're not subject to it unless you know they're over fifteen thousand square feet? I, I just don't Correct. know many. Yes. Yes, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So if you're building okay. a single family home in this town, or if you're building, let's say, a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex, you're probably not going to be caught in this program. But in three years, it could be amended so that it does apply to those people. If that's the direction the city wants to go at that time. Okay. Okay, I, I, I would like to see us encourage more energy efficiency, um, but I, I think it, to me it makes more sense to look at it per unit, whether the unit is one unit of a multi-townhouse, multi-family development, or a, a luxury home. Right, but we're not, but when you think about it, we're not allocating the cost of construction per unit. So when they come in and build, let's say, the Ray Hotel or one of these apartment complexes that has a hundred units in it. They come in and fill out their paperwork and please Ms. Alvarez or Mr. Edwards jump in if I'm wrong here. They put down their cost of construction for the entire job, not per unit. I realize that. However, you could do the math. Right, you know, but, if you were doing it. How do we how do we incentivize the smaller, you know, um develop not development, but you know, individual homes or um or whatever to have more energy efficiency? We oh, you mean like your single family homeowner? Yeah, like your single family homeowner even. I mean, I don't know what the percentages are of, you know, people building or adding on or doing additions or whatever, but. Well, well I we, mean, we, I just look upon it as people will either make that choice for themselves or they won't. But I think that at this point in time, given the economy and everything else, hitting uh, those probably least able to afford it with increased costs. Um, you know, I, I just, I just don't think that that's prudent at this particular time. Um, can, can at I any rate, say, this, can I just say that excuse these me? increased costs that you're referring to have been proven by the studies, and Mr. Kent testified as to this, to, to be offset significantly, if not totally, by the ultimate cost savings. So. I think quibbling, making it 15,000 will effectively eliminate virtually all residential development, particularly single family development. It might not um, on, on a group of townhouses, but it would on this. And I think we're making the mistake this, by, by cutting it off at, at 15,000. This ordinance and concept this concept, the green concept has been in play probably for 25 mm -hmm. years or more. In my recollection, it's been in play for at least 25 okay. years. And it's been in, discussed by the city since 2015, according to what Mr. Kent, what uh, Mr. Edwards had said. So if you want, I mean, we've got to start somewhere. And if you think, if you think 5,000 is, is too low and, I think fifteen thousand is way too high. If I if so I might make just, it, just make jump it in or make it seventy five hundred. And can, then can just I, let's move on. And we're gonna review it in three years anyway. If I could just jump Mr. in Mr. Zeller, excuse me one second. Ms. Blankenship, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um I, from what I understand, um uh, the 15,000 square foot minimum is causing uh, some people to feel a little um, unsure if that's where, how high they want to go. So um, perhaps language that we could include in the motion and in, in the amended emotion would be something that incentivize like keep it at 15,000 square feet, but some sort of incentive program for 5,000 to 15,000 square feet that if they chose to participate in the LEED program that they would either get some sort of um, something that would incentivize it. 
I mean, that's a possibility. I'm looking at the language that the Historic Preservation Board used and that the DDA used and, and their recommendations. I'm trying to sort of go off of that. Um, and, you know, something, a, a phasing. I, you know, I'm unsure where to, where to get the consensus um, from the board because I've seen, this doesn't seem like we have it. Uh, Mr. Davey, do you see a consensus? Am I missing it? No, I think that I think I think you're right. And I think that, um, you know, I, I mean, listen, I actually would love to see the city um, incentivize the builders to do this. But we're in tough economic times. The city's got its budget problems. I don't know if the city's in a position to start handing out money to developers in order to uh, improve these properties. But um, if that's it something the city money. feels comfortable doing, that would it doesn't be have to be money. It doesn't have oh, to be right. money. Right. It could be something else, whatever. Okay. But um, the normal incentive is money. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, how about these days? <laughs> <time>. <laughs> Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, how about expedited building uh, permit yeah. review? Well, I don't think that's happening right now. But, um, I, think, I think the way you have that written now, Ms. Blankenship, Ms. Alvarez added in the language. Okay. And I think that the only other thing that I would suggest would be change gold to silver. Um, and then, okay, so then we can uh, add in language to... I'm you're just changing it from gold to silver. There's not much of a difference, and you and it's been silver for all these years. You have to move on. You, I would, you are, but I it's only been language. silver above 50,000 square feet, Mr. Zeller. I would just use the language to, to look at tiering, tiering the, the certification yeah. levels. Perhaps that's something. Instead of just saying we're going to go to silver, right. maybe there's a way to tier it for residential to commercial. That'd be great. That effect. That's um, perfect. Miss Morrison, did you want to say something? Yes. Uh, when, you, when you look at this recommend, I'm sorry, Chris. Did you want to go? Yes. No, go ahead, Ms. Morrison, please. Um, I would take out the language of with an incentive program for any other new construction, not limited to 5,000 feet, because maybe somebody wants to come in and build a 2,000 square foot house and put solar panels on. We should be jumping all over that, you know? So if we could take out incentive yes. that's right all new construction and are we going to um tear it in that it would be tiered in it would be phased in over the next two years um yeah, i mean three years so it's not by so, a switch three, yeah three years goes by so quickly on this i mean you know i think that if we make these two changes to the fifteen thousand, try to incentivize it from zero to fourteen nine 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 um you know i think uh the city commit everybody else has had their bite at this the city commission will too they're gonna do it right so um, can, can i make a quick note here um i mean i think it's important we remember that this is just a recommendation and most of the other boards their language seem to be pretty vague maybe we don't have to have this completely maybe we could keep this a little more vague and just get across the point that we want to be a little more flexible with the enforcement of this as it pertains to single family homes. Well, I think cut the, folks other board, slack without the other boards, Mr. Long, were um, really looking at this in a completely advisory fashion. This has to come before us for a recommendation to the city. It doesn't have to go to the other boards. So, and I just think that to take the level up to gold and reduce the tier level from 50,000 by 90% to 5,000 is a pretty hefty change in one move. Yeah. Um, Mr. The, the, Mr. Chairman, can I make uh, one more observation? Please, Mr. Weinberg, go ahead. With building costs rising for uh, uh, mid-level luxury, uh, in Palm Beach County, rising from approximately six fifty to seven hundred dollars a square foot a year ago, to closing in on a thousand dollars a square foot. Yep, yep. If you're building a fifteen thousand square foot house, and there are no um, uh, lack of houses of that size being built, just moved uh, from from next door to a house that is almost 15,000 square feet on the water. Um, maybe 
the consideration should be given to that tier between uh, 3,500 to 10,000 square feet as silver, or 5,000 to 10,000 above 10, 12, 5 gold. Because if you're if you're a, if you're a commercial developer building condos or townhouses or commercial retail property, you can certainly build that into your cost of doing business. Uh, the gold certification. So this tiering idea, I think I personally think it's a good idea. I don't know exactly what form it takes, but it does recognize the uh, the economic difference between the uh, entity that's building a modest house of 5,000 or 6,000 square feet, uh, which today is considered relatively average, uh, and the person is building a, a, a complex development. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. I think from, from my motion, that would be a little too specific to what I'm looking for. I think that the, the staff is going to carry forward things like that to the commission. I would hope that they do. Um, and so I would just put forward my motion um, with okay. the with the uh, amendments as 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 presented on the screen yep Please. second just um real, real quick Bennett. just a oh, excuse me excuse me there's a motion on the floor and a second and it's not for the purposes oh, of discussion chris, chris is no, mr. Bennett, go ahead mr. sorry mr. Bennett. What, mr bennett excuse me mr bennett please no um i just want a, a point clarification just because sure. the way we've been talking about the tiers and such um, so 15,000 square foot is the minimum at which it is a requirement. Anything under 15,000 square feet is where the incentive program would be provided because it's not required under 15,000. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Great. Okay. Thanks. And if I can get a, a clarification also, we went, we've went we gone back and forth between gold and silver. Um, I think that we're just going to do the tiering certification levels without a, a clear direction from this board about what that means. Um, okay. We have Chair, you're muted. <laughs> I am. Can you please call the roll? <laughs> Can we move the question? Excuse me? Are we voting? Can we vote? Um, yes, Mr. We Zeller, we're voting right now. Diane's going to be calling the roll. There's a motion and a second. Joy Hall. Uh, God, this is tough. This is a really tough, <laughs> tough one. Um, I guess I'll vote yes. I think it must it should be much stronger, but I can make those views known to the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howell. Ellen Zeller. I'll vote yes. This is this, this is not my preference that it be as high as fifteen thousand. I think it should be lower. I'm glad we're keeping it at gold. So I'm voting yes. Thank you. Blankenship? Yes. Max Weinberg. Yes, with a, a strong suggestion that the commission look at the various levels and incentive programs that can be instituted. Rob Long? Yes. Christina Morrison? This is a good start, so yes. Chris Davey? Yes. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. And could you tell me who made the motion and who made the second again? That, I'm sorry. That was uh, Ms. Blankenship okay. on the motion. And I believe on the second, it was either, I think it was Ms. Howell or Mr. Zeller. I, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't think either one of us made the second on that. Oh, you didn't? Then Diana, I think I did. I think oh, I did. Morrison. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, thank you very much for your, your time and excellent discussion and points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Edwards. And with that, we can move on to item uh, 8A, quasi-judicial item, hearing number Delray Townhomes, file number 2020-0202. 
and Ms. Issa. Thank you, Chairman Davey. Um, for the record, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes, I can, crystal clear. Okay, great. Um, for the record, I would like to enter into the record uh, city case number 2020-202, which is a plat for the Delray, uh, a certification of preliminary plat and recommendation to the city commission for final approval for the Delray East townhomes plat. Um, the applicant is here. They do not have a presentation, but um, want to introduce themselves and do a little okay. summary for you. So. so this is Lenny Smith. Can you hear me? Yes, just uh, before we start, Diane, we do need you to swear yes. everyone in, please. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. I forgot about that because we didn't handle it earlier. Please raise your right hand by the authority vested in me, the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, so my name is Lenny Smith. I am representing the developer of the Delray East project. Um, this is a one building of seven townhouses um, that we are uh, proposing in uh, on Florida Boulevard in Tropic Isle. And um, we are looking to plat the seven lots individually. It is currently three vacant lots and one single family home. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Issa? Yes. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay. Sure. Elizabeth, we're seeing the presenter side of the. <laughs> okay. Let me change that for you. And. Okay. Is that better? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Like I said, um, city case number 2020 202, um, Delray East Town Homes. Okay. Um, the subject properties, which consists of 0.59 acres, are generally located east of South Federal Highway at the intersection of Florida Boulevard and Lamatt Avenue. Located at 2800 through 2812 Florida Boulevard, the properties are all zoned medium density residential. RM with a land use map designation of transitional TR. To give you a little background about the site, the property located at 2800 Florida Boulevard is developed with an existing single family home, which will be demolished. The properties at 2808, 2810, and 2812 were created in 2004 via the Florida Boulevard townhomes plat which was associated with an approved class five site plan application for a three unit townhome project. The properties were never developed and the approval subsequently expired as such the lots remain vacant. The applicant has submitted a class five site plan application for a two story seven unit townhome development with associated parking and landscaping, which will, review, which will be reviewed by the site plan review and appearance board at an upcoming meeting. This major subdivision is required as part of the site plan approval process to create and establish the seven fee simple lots required for the townhouse development. The proposed project consists of a two story, seven unit townhome development with associated parking and landscaping. All seven units are proposed with a two car garage and driveway with space to park an additional vehicle. The project does not include a common area or other amenities. Pursuant to section 43302 townhouses and townhouse type of development, each townhouse or townhouse type of development shall be platted with a minimum designation of the interior street system as a tract. When the dwelling units are to be sold, each unit must be shown on the plat. The proposed plat, um, which includes seven lots for each townhouses, includes the following. A replat of lots 64 through 68, inclusive of block 34, Delbertone Park, 
and lots one through three inclusive of the Florida Boulevard townhomes at Delray Beach Platte. Dedication is lots one through seven for each of the individual fee simple townhomes. Dedication of tract A to the city of Delray Beach is public right of way and dedication of a 10 foot general utility easement along the front of the property and access easement to the rear of the townhomes for purposes of ingress and egress and maintenance for the owners of lots one through seven and a drainage easement along Florida Boulevard and the corner of Lamatt Avenue. The applicant was required to um, provide certain findings um, and standards for plat actions, which were all um, detailed in the staff report. And so the optional board motions for action to continue with direction to move approval of the preliminary plat and recommendation of approval to the city commission um, or to move denial of uh, uh, finding that the plat is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and does not meet for set forth the uh, land building regulations. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Issa. Um, with that, uh, I would turn it to my colleagues on the board and ask, does anybody have any questions? I mean, so this really chair, just a straightforward replat. Chair, this is a quasi judicial item, so we do have to take the five minute break for. Oh, yes. Comment. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. And I'm looking. We, I forgot this was quasi judicial. Yes. yes so before, um, we, before we take that break, if we could just do ex parte. So we please. Sure. If I could ask uh, my colleagues, has anybody had any ex parte communication on this item? None yeah, for sorry. sorry. Let's go one at a time. Ms. Blankenship. <laughs> None for me. Thank you. Mr. Long. None here. Thanks. Ms. Morrison. Well, I know the property well, but I didn't talk to the developer. Okay. Mr. Zeller. I drove by the site and the surrounding area. Mr. Weinberg. I also drove by the site. No conversations regarding it, though. <laughs> Ms. Howell. Ms. Howell. Uh, maybe she's, we'll have to come back to her because um, I don't see her on my screen. Um, and I had, there's no, I have no ex parte communication. I did not even go by the site. Um, Mr. Bennett, thank you for reminding us of that. We can now take a five minute break and see if there's any public comment on this item. So I have the time right now at 727. Let's regroup here at 733 in six minutes and uh, Diane can play us whatever public comment there is on this item. Okay. okay. Can I just ask Diane a question? About sure, Ms. Taylor. So yes. I, I called in my cell. Can I call in from my house phone? Will that work as well? That same number? It should, it should. Mr. Bennett. Yeah, it, it, it should. Why don't you try that while we're on the break? And if there's an issue, IT can help us. That sounds okay. great. Thank you, everybody. Great. I'll see you back here at 733. Man, what do you have the do we have the access code mr zeller just uh you're not muted if you want to mute while you're working on that uh, so i need i didn't have the access code let me see i don't want to cut myself off um is the access code one seven three 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 two eight five seven eight um mr zeller it should just be a phone number i'm sorry it should just be a phone number that you're calling diane um since yes. we're still live streaming maybe um you can call mr zeller directly or, or, or do something that's not being transmitted to the public okay oh we are on live stream i'll call him okay thanks call me on five six one Three three zero nine four one one.
Diane? Yes. I see you're back. Do we yes. have any public comment on this item? Uh, we do not. We do not. Okay. Um, so with that, we're back. Um, I just wanted to circle back one more minute. Ms. Howell? Hello? If Joy Howell was there, we have to ask her about ex parte communication. She was the one person who we didn't get an answer from. Yep, Chair, we're still missing. Looks like Rob Long. And just want to make sure that Mr. Zeller is connected to us in some fashion. <laughs> so, yeah. Mr. Zeller, can you please say something so we know you okay. can hear you? Mr. Zeller? Uh, can you just say something so we know your sound is working? All right. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Fine. Thank you. Okay. We so wanted to make sure right, after the break you. you had contact. Um, is Mel, has Ms. Howell come back? Okay. No, she hasn't. Um, hopefully she'll come back shortly. Um, great. With that being said, uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions for the applicant or Ms. Issa? I do, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Weinberg, go ahead. Just a clarification, really. Uh, the public right of way of Tract A, is that sidewalk? It's a small spot. And it looks like it's, you know, it's curved. It's a side. Is it a sidewalk? Uh, I can answer that. Um, it is a sidewalk. We, there is an existing sidewalk on Lamotte on the side road. So we are having to install the sidewalk that connects to it. So that's why it's curved like that. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Yes. Uh, the other questions I have uh, address some of the uh, uh, issues that have not been uh, decided in the application schools, water, uh, in the sewer, solid waste and traffic have. Is that conditioned? Uh, is this entire project conditioned on getting those uh, reports and those approvals? They actually, yes. they actually <laughs> did receive the SCAD, the SCAD letter. We had just already um, up to, uploaded the agenda. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention that to you guys. Um, okay. So they did get the SCAD letter. Um, and uh, it's 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 intended to generate one student at each level, elementary, um, middle, and high school. And there was sufficient capacity um, for middle and high school. There was a negative capacity for the elementary school. It is a Boca school that the that the student would be going to. Um, yes. And so there is also a, a, a recommended fee that the applicant pay to the school board um, in order to address that deficit. So that letter was provided. Um, so uh, so they did get the SCAD from the school board. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all I had. I think it's a nice project. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Anybody else? Are we ready for a motion on this one? I have, um, I have a couple of questions. Oh, I, have, I have two questions for the applicant. Uh, first one, is this for a rental project or a sale project? It will be for sale. Okay, is there going to be an HOA? Yes, we will have to create an HOA. Are you proposing any workforce housing? No. Why not? That's not the way the project has been designed. Are you proposing any LEED certification? No, not at this time. Why not? That's not the way the project was designed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Anybody else? Ms. I I just wanted to correct. Yeah, in the staff report on the first page, there was a typo. Uh, it says, states a property located at 2900 Florida Boulevard is 
developed with an existing single family home. It's supposed to be 2800 Florida Boulevard. So that's all. Okay. Oh. Motion to approve. Can I make a motion to approve? Uh, sure, Ms. Morrison, you can make it a motion to approve. You'd want to read the motion that's in the staff report if you could. Can you put that up, Elizabeth, please? <laughs> if you want to look, it's on the last page of the staff report. You flip flopped again. <laughs> I can't, I can't read it. <laughs> if you can get rid of the subtitles box or flip flop it, one or the other. Nope. That's better. <laughs> Busy, so we just need, uh, oh, I want to know if, if anybody else, um, I can make a motion. Ms. Blankenship, do you have the staff report in front of you? I do. Thank Ms. you. Morrison. Ms. Morrison, I know you made a motion. Um, no, let, let it. I'll if second it. <laughs> if you could withdraw that motion and second Julian's, that would be great. I withdraw my motion. Bow to uh, Um A move approval of the preliminary plat and recommendation of approval to the city commission for the certification of the final plat for Delaware East Townhomes. Finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets criteria set forth in land development regulations. Second. Second by Ms. Morrison, motion by Ms. Blankenship. Diane, if you could please call the roll. Julie Hall. <laughs> Joy. Okay. She's still she's, uh, she's not responding for whatever reason, so. Joy, can you hear us? No, she can't, so just move on. Put her down as absent. Ellen <laughs> Zeller? I'll vote yes, it's an improvement over certainly a big improvement over what's there now. I'm very disappointed that the applicant has not considered workforce housing. I think that's a, an important criteria in every project that we approve, but I have to vote yes. Julie Jenkinship? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Rob Long? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Chris Davies? Yes. And I vote yes also, Diane. Oh, okay. thank you. Uh, Ms. Al, did you have any ex parte uh, for that item? No, I did not. Great, Very good. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Issa and Ms. Smith. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you both so much. So with that, we can move on to the item of the evening. Item 8B, 4652-133rd Road South, file number 2020-024. And on that, we will be hearing from Ms. Dossery. If I pronounce that right or wrong, yeah. tell me. <laughs> no, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. So, good evening, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. We have a presentation here for item 7B. Can I just and interrupt you one second? I'm sorry, Ms. Dossery. Um, yes. Diane, has everybody been sworn on this item? Um, I don't think the applicants, um, I believe they're um, in the conference room, they have not been sworn in yet. Okay. Um, Ms. Dossery, have you been sworn? I have not. Okay. So, Diane, maybe you could swear Ms. Dossery in, and then when Mr. Weiner comes on, we can swear his team in. Sure. I'm off of mute if you want, if you would like us to be sworn in. Oh, Mr. Weiner's on right now, so that's perfect. 
Mr. Wires, your right hand. Around, um, in on the podium. You see the camera button. Do you want me to? Do you want me to start the video, or or I mean to? Uh... Yes, please. All right. There we go. Perfect. Great, Diane. Sure. Please raise your right hand by the authority vested me, the notary, the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank you very much. Ms. Dossery, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Diane, if you could go ahead and pass the presenter ball to me, I'll go ahead and get their presentation started. Sure. Mine too. And have we lost Miss Howell again? I see that camera's off, just making sure. Okay, perfect. And um, Chair- I'm gonna ask for ex parte. Yes, ex parte as well. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, anybody has ex parte communication, let's go through the board. Ms. Morrison? I know the property well, but I have not spoken to the developer. Okay, Ms. Blankenship? No, none for me, thank you. Mr. Weinberg? Yes, I drove by the site. Mr. Zeller. Mr. Zeller, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I, I was I visited the site. When I did that, there was a resident walking her dog. She engaged me in a brief conversation. With regard to that, I was supposed to do a um, rich cat and commissioner okay thank you mr Zeller. mr long done here thanks ms howell no none okay i i visited the site um i saw somebody posted on facebook didn't read all the posts and i received one or two emails which i forwarded to Ms. Miller, the board secretary for inclusion in the record and for distribution to the rest of the board. Okay. And so, Chair, just uh, just briefly a point of clarification from Ms. Morrison. Um, I see you didn't talk to the developer. Did you talk to, to anybody, developer or public about the item? No, sir. Great. Thank you so much. In terms of, if I could just amend and say I did also, this is Julian for the record, also did see posts on Facebook, but not engaged in them. And of course, the emails that are on the server that I think we all have. Sure. Great. Thank you, Ms. Blankenship. Okay, um, Ms. Dossery, back to you for a third time. <laughs> sure. Mr. Weiner, whenever you're ready, you can proceed and I'll advance the slides on your on your queue. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. For the record, I am Michael Weiner with a business address of 6111 Broken Sound Parkway, Boca Raton, Florida. I'm here on behalf of Ocean Ridge Rentals, LLC, whose principal is Ms. Beata Galloway, a Delray Beach resident. Also joining Ms. Galloway is myself and myself is Mr. Mark Richards and Mr. Adam Kerr of Kimley Horn. Uh, previously made part of the record is my CV and the CV of Mr. Richards and Mr. Kerr. Um, you may be familiar with us. We've spoken to you before. Um, we would like to qualify ourselves as experts. We know we are re remote. I don't know if you had time to look at our CV. If you have any questions from us in order to qualify us as experts, the time is now. But if you'll qualify us as experts, we can move on to the presentation. I, Mr. Wine, I don't think that's something that's within the board's purview, but if your CV and your staff CVs have been included as a record, you know, those will be included as part of your experience. They are. And um, if the board does not want to rule on that, I think the record is clear that we are experts in our respective areas. Um, the applicant is re requested to rezone a three acre parcel with an address of 4652 130. Third Road South. It's approximately one tenth of a mile west of Barwick Road. Um, would you advance the slide? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, it is located between two county pockets of equal or greater size. A single family home once existed on the property. It was previously demolished. The city first purchased the property 15 years ago. 
uh, and then after it owned it, it annexed it. When annexed, the property was assigned a future land use map designation of medium density and was giving a zoning of residential dash eight dwelling units per acre. If you'd advance the slide, please. As the staff report details, a total of 25 units could be built. The staff also points out that there are no additional density incentives available for this location. Elsewhere in the city there is, but not here. Um, this is not true of the county pockets, and I'll explain that more later. The applicant re request is related to a proposed class five site plan allowing for 35 units, obviously more than the present 25. So the only issue we are discussing tonight is 10 additional residential units, 10 more families moving to the Barwick Road area. To receive those additional units, we must go through the city procedure, and they label it as a rezoning. Um, there is no neighborhood plan or a redevelopment plan, so we are guided by the ordinances. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, looking at those ordinances, we should put this in perspective. So uh, the project, if you put it in the middle of a one square mile radius, you'll find approximately 2,500 units yeah, within a one mile radius. 2,500 units. We're talking about 10. We're talking about one third of 1% of that housing number. That's it. And it is not as if there's any precedent setting for the community. The area is almost completely developed. And later in the presentation, I have a slide on this and, and it'll give you a visual. So it's important to keep that fact in mind. Let's discuss the process for this de minimis increase. The process is a discussion of what is best for the whole city of Delray, Florida. As a matter of public policy, based on rules and laws passed by multiple city commissions over decades, reflecting experiences of not what just troubles the citizens at this moment, but is what is best for all of the city of Delray. So if an entrepreneur has a good idea that meets the intent of the laws and has public purposes in mind, then it should be granted. We know this because the area already has a future land use map designation that allows this possible application. So the comprehensive plan has already given you a signal. It's told you you should consider this. Given that it is a small scale, three acres, and by the way, Delray Beach is 10,000 acres, um, the process is called quasi-judicial. In other words, you sit as quasi-judges with legal boundaries. You've heard repeatedly the opening remarks that are given for quasi-judicial hearings. I'm surprised Attorney Bennett didn't give it here today, but I can remind you, evaluation is not by the number of residents either in favor or against. Evaluation is not by the number of residents either in favor or against. The local code calls the process a rezoning, but notice there is no change in use. It's residential now, it'll be residential after this hearing. The only change is in the number of units. So as you go through the varying rules, you know the request is already compatible, already consistent with use. As I said, the sole issue is whether 10 more units on three acres would fail to meet the code's benchmarks. So getting to those rules, the matter is proceeding under section 2.4.5 of the LDRs. And it is up there for you, all right? Um, to read the 2.4.5, the requested zoning is of similar intensity as allowed under the land use map, and that is more appropriate for the property based upon the circumstances particular to the site and the neighborhood. So breaking that down, we are talking about a density only that must be similar. It does not have to be identical. If we could go to the next slide, please. Let's cover that proposition. So there's a table on, on the staff report on page two. And if you look at that staff report, and they'll probably cover it for you, there's a column called land use. And that's an important column because you have to 
find out what's similar to the land use, not what's actually built. It's not the construction that's in place. We have to compare it to the land use map. This makes perfect sense because the decision you're making, what you're studying, is what's appropriate for future development. It is not a snapshot of this moment. It's not a snapshot of the past. So let's look at this property when the slide is up. You can see the arrow pointing to it. Notice that it's a dark yellow, just like the, the uh, dark yellow to the south of it. The land use is MD, that's medium density. That specifically allows up to 12 units per acre. Um, so everything to the south is of the same intensity. Now, what about to the sides, to the east and the west? You notice they have some dots in them. That's because they're called county pockets, and they have a designation in the county of RM5. Sounds like a lot less, but it's not. It's similar. So let me explain. I mentioned it before. Our site can't get any density bonuses, but RM sites in the county can. In the urban suburban tier, that's where we are, you're able to double the density under the county's affordable housing program. We just don't have that locally. It's not part of our code, it is part of the county's code. So you're up to 10 units per acre on both sides in that dotted area. And if you, you buy transferred development rights, you can get another three. So you can get up to 13 on those two sites that are immediately next to us. The only border we haven't talked about is Bexley Park. So Bexley Park is separated by not one road, two roads from this site. There's 133rd Road South, and then there's their own internal road. There is no house that backs up to Ms. Galloway's property. So on this fourth side, it's true, the designation is five units to the acre, but the properties are still similar. Remember, they only have to be similar. They are both residential. If we could go to the next so slide, it'll make it abundantly clear. Okay, so this shows three areas in Delray Beach, Florida. Beginning to the left is the Meridian, a condominium of four stories in height that is approximately 15 units to the acre, up against one of the most successful single family home areas in Delray Beach, Florida, the southern portion of the Marina District. The middle area shows the middle site. That's the one in the middle. Thank you. The middle site shows the lakes of Delray with a future land use map of MD, just like us, next to single family residents along Dotterill, Lindell, and um, Audubon Boulevard. This is one of the great single family neighborhoods and it is surrounded by higher density. You can see the large buildings if you look on the, uh, on the left side of the picture and if you look at the top of the picture. That community has thrived. Homes are reaching values in excess of $600,000 and it's been there for 40 years, existed side by side, no community implosion, no blight. And by the way, Lakes of Del Rey is 24 units to the acre, twice what we're asking for. The third picture over on the right-hand side, that's City Walk, which is next to our historic Bankers Row, cottage homes of single story. During their coexistence, Bankers Row has flourished. In fact, there was a recent sale there of $850,000 for a cottage. And it was immediately behind City Walk. This is the factual proof that densities coexist without a parade of horribles. So, like Lake of, Lakes of Del Rey, the use at this density is similar. In summary, for this particular issue, on three sides, which make up 88% of the boundary of this property, there is densities equal to or exceeding our request. On one side, the north side, separated by two roads from the closest house, is a remaining portion of the boundary, 12% of the boundary, it's LD. But this is still similar to MD as proven by the fact that there is a zoning pattern, a, a zoning pattern repeated in Delray Beach, Florida, and that it exists without adverse effect. The staff report goes on to discuss the land use map, which I just dealt with. It also discusses concurrency, consistency, compliance. We can go through these quickly because the staff report indicates they're all met. Schools, water, sewer, solid waste, drainage, parks, and yes, even traffic. But let's take a, a little bit of time on that last one. 
Uh, we do have a traffic performance letter from the county in a study. Um, it may need some refinement, but it it does show it, uh, uh, 30, actually 36 units. We're only building 35. Um, regardless, the peak PM trips are about 20 for the whole project. That's everything. So the 10 units account for approximately six of those trips. Six. To compare, an intersection such as Lake Ida and Barwick has 3,000 trips during PM hours. So just like the units that we're adding to the area is infinitesimal, it's less than a percent, the trips we're adding are two-tenths of one percent. So let's talk about the real problem of traffic, and which you're not considering at this hearing, but I thought you wanted to look, look at it. And it really has to do with the location of the school. So let me bring Adam Kerr here to speak. Adam's the one who gave me the coaching on the particular numbers that I just gave you. We did have a traffic expert. Mr. Kerr, look at this. So please address the uh, board. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Adam Kerr with Kimley Horn and Associates, 1920 Wakiva Way in West Palm Beach, uh, Florida. I did confer with Mr. Weiner prior to this, so the facts that he stated uh, prior to this, uh, I, I am in agreement with. We did confer prior to this. Um, as he stated, we do have concurrence from Palm Beach County, and they have determined that this project, the full a number of units uh, is an insignificant amount of tra uh, traffic on all of the roads in the area. Next slide, please. Next. Thank you. Uh, and then I'd also like to point out that the, the real issue with traffic is not the capacity um, on Barwick Road or on Coconut or any of the roads around there. It's actually the operations of the elementary school nearby. If any of you have been in the area, you, you would definitely uh, recognize that as uh, the, the traffic problem, and that's due to uh, this, the, the elementary school, which has been in operation for, for many years, decades, and has an insufficient queuing uh, uh, area on site to allow people who are picking up students to wait on site. So instead, they, uh, they wait on Sable Lakes Road and then also on Barwick, and, and that's the, the isolated uh, traffic concern is during that pickup time in the mid-afternoon. But throughout the course of the day, it's not a capacity issue on, on Barwick or the nearby intersections. So with that, mm -hmm. thank you. Let's, let's, let's stick on this slide for a minute. So as you can full well tell, as I mentioned, there's very little else to develop out here. Um, so this is, you're not, you're not wholesale letting this community out into a different type of development. Um, we are really talking about just eight additional units. And also, if, if uh, oh, Barwick Road, that segment of Barwick Road is about a half a mile. So, so if you, you double that segment, you can see how easily, um, one mile, what, uh, if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, that takes you about uh, two minutes to go. You can easily see there's already 2,500 units or more um, in and around a one mile radius. So you can see it's developed. We're a infinitesimal addition. Um, and this brings up us to the last uh, portion of the staff report, and it really has to do with the beneficial aspect of this particular ac application, why it is a good idea with a public purpose. The area was built in the 1980s for the most part. New housing choices are necessary to do as the comprehensive plan states support new and revitalized housing. Those are words out of the comprehensive plan. There's a policy, ND 1.2.7. It's mentioned in the staff report. It gives a clear statement. Use medium density residential. Don't forget, we are zoned medium density. We just have a different suffix. Use medium density residential land use to create neighborhoods with a wide range of housing types. Not my language, your comprehensive plan. That's what you're supposed to be considering. There is a section 3.2.2 uh, in our code. It is mentioned in the staff report. It has four additional standards. Two have nothing to do with us. Uh, they relate to automotive and strip commercial. One standard does have to do with us. It talks about incompatibility, but we've already demonstrated, factually demonstrated by the evidence of 40 years of existence that we are compatible. So that standard falls to us. The last standard, 
says that you must use the most restrictive zoning district. And you might think that might have some influence on this. However, we've met that standard as well. We are not changing the zoning district. It's RM now, and as I said, it'll be RM after this vote. This section does not bar a change in a suffix or in a designation. Now, maybe it might change us if we wanted PRD or we wanted RO, but we're not asking for that. If it's interpreted in any other way, it means that the rest of the LDRs are meaningless. Why would you have all those other provisions? And that no residential density can ever be changed, ever. Can't mean that. This would be akin to a population cap, and that is a strategy that has legally failed before. Having met the new law, let me bring Mark and Beata to the uh, podium here. Well, we don't have a podium, to the, uh, to the screen, and they'll explain the project to you. It's important because it also demonstrates how we're meeting the comprehensive plan. Thanks, Michael. And Mr. Chair, members of the board, I have been sworn uh, for the record, 1615 South Congress, Delray Beach 33445, and my name is Mark Rickards. I'm a certified planner with Kimley Horn. Um, Rebecca, if you could advance maybe twice and one more time and one more time. Here we go. Okay, so thank you. So I, I wanted to touch on a, on a couple of points uh, that Michael made uh, in terms of the surrounding community and general livability. What we're talking about is a two-story uh, project. We're not, it's not four, it's not five stories. It's, it's this at the same scale as a single family home. The community improvement that I'm about to talk about on the next slide um, has to do with 133rd Road South. And some of the board mentioned that they'd driven out to the site. Uh, if you have, and if you don't mind, Rebecca, advance into the next slide. Um, if you had what, what you'd see, and, and again, this is Bexley Park on the left. There's a low wall there, a fence, a hedge, and some mature trees. What, what you see is a, is a roadway width that's at, at point 16 to 18 feet. That's for a two-way road. So if you uh, drive a truck like me and you meet a truck, you, you have an issue. You may need to back up. Um, if I could go to the next slide. Part of the project that we're um, proud of and worked hard with staff to bring about was, and if I could advance one more time, I'll highlight it. And I'm sorry, I, I thought I'd be driving. I, I don't mean to be aggravating, Rebecca. Um, and, and that's good, thank you. Um, on the north side there, and again, in this slide, north is up, um, we are proposing a five-foot sidewalk extending from the property all the way east to Barwick Road. It has a brand new sidewalk. There's not one that exists. That same uh, scenario I talked about, two cars meeting, if you had a pedestrian on the road at the same time, that's three people uh, needing to figure something out. Uh, we're also dedicating 25 feet of additional right-of-way on the south side, which is the north 25 feet of this property. That 25 feet will be used to improve uh, 133rd Road in the future. Um, but right now, there's a commitment to improve the 133rd Road South uh, section uh, to make it a little more drivable and um, a continuous 20-foot section, at least within our uh, ability to do so, to improve that existing condition. And that's separate from the five-foot sidewalk. So again, right now, 133rd Road South is a 25-foot road, a, a right-of-way but the improvement takes up 16 to 18 feet. We're proposing the dedication of another 25 feet and improvements from the site um, to Barwick Road. That includes a sidewalk and an improved roadway section. Um, if I could go to the next slide. Um, on this slide, I wanted to point out uh, north is to the right. If I could go to the next uh, slide. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a single point of entry. I'm gonna talk about the a um, couple of criteria that we have that the board needs to review in terms of making a decision. I want to point out a couple things if you can keep this layout in mind. And I know we aren't voting on a site plan tonight, but I think it's good for a frame of reference. It's a single point of entry. There's a turnaround at the south. That is for fire trucks to turn around. There's not a cut through road or a uh, ability to enter the site and end up on someone else's property. Um, there's also a pool and clubhouse amenity area for the guests, and again, sidewalks on the property that will tie across moving north to the north side of 133rd Road South for that new sidewalk. So with that, keeping that in mind, if I could go to the next slide, I want to talk through, and, and again, this is the two-story scale. We are not talking about 
uh, mid-rise or, or high-rise development here. And if I could go to the next slide, Rebecca. Thank you. So here, I just want to take a, a moment. I'm sure the board's very familiar with all of these criteria. The traffic circulation system, um, it doesn't allow for through traffic, and it's not uh, long enough to allow for anyone to achieve a high speed. Uh, the building placement has been done such that it's perpendicular to 133rd Road South. It really does reduce the overall massing. We've increased all of the setbacks and landscapes or, or landscape buffers on the property line by 25% um, per this performance standard C. Um, D talks about roof design, varied streetscape and diversity and the window and door locations. REG Architects has done a great job with the elevations and I know we're not voting on that tonight. Uh, with this in mind, this performance standard in mind. Um, unit type size and floor plan mixes. We have a mix of two and three bedroom units uh, proposed. Um, F doesn't apply. We don't have, we didn't have existing water bodies on site or a preserve area or Cypress Head to preserve. But as I mentioned a few times on 133rd, we did, um, we are expanding and improving greatly the bike and pedestrian network and connections to Barwick in terms of the sidewalk and the improvement to 133rd. If I could go to the next slide. So Michael touched on some of these. You have within the branded Always Delray Comprehensive Plan some uh, direct objectives that encourage infill development like this. Um, objective 3.1 talks about opportunities uh, to accommodate the needs of both existing and future residents. Um, I don't think the future residence portion of that uh, objective is a mistake. I think Delray is experiencing uh, the same thing that much of Florida is experiencing in terms of people moving to the Sunshine State and wanting a great place to live. Delray is a great choice. Um, if I could back up just a couple of uh, times, Rebecca, and I'm sorry for some of these animations. I didn't realize the form. I thought I'd be sort of controlling that, but the policy. 3.1.4, and thank you. Um, this is an important one too. It talks about encouraging the development of vacant or undeveloped lands for housing uh, and mixed uses. And if I could go to the next um, comprehensive plan element. This one was interesting to me, and I think it's, something, it's worthy of consideration. Um, there's direct encouragement to support uh, an increase of housing options as a means of attracting healthcare pr uh, practitioners. And these next two, Rebecca, are really just uh, local news articles, and I'm sure you've seen uh, single-family home prices are skyrocketing, and there really is a need for uh, additional options uh, for living in, in Delray. If I could go to the next slide. I just wanted to turn it over to the owner uh, and operator, Beata Galloway. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'm Beata Galloway. I'm the owner and managing director of Ocean Ridge Rentals. Um, and I'm going to try not to be redundant as to what um, Mark and Michael have mentioned before. They did a fantastic job in putting out all the details. I just wanted to reemphasize our intent and the motivation behind this project. So um, I've been living in Delray on and off since the late 90s. I remember Atlantic Avenue when it was 32 East and nothing else. <laughs> and you certainly didn't go East where the marketplace is now because it was scary. Um, when we moved back um, in the early 2000s with my family, we looked for rental units because we had two young children. We weren't secure about what jobs you would find. And we had a hard time finding rental units and uh, rental properties. My parents live um, in that area. They live in a colony called, uh, in a um, development called the Colony. So I'm very familiar with the area. And even now, almost 20 years later, there are very few rental properties and any affordable housing choices for young professionals who are moving in this area and aren't willing to, you know, spend their entire savings on a down payment on a home or even more so young families who would like to have a great public school like Banyan Creek Elementary in their backyard and who are looking for affordable options um, in a very safe residential area of Delray. Um, asking for these additional 10 units will allow me to build a project that is more affordable, especially in light of what happened during COVID and the explosion of building costs. 
there are an economies of scale when it comes to building. Uh, I mean, lumber has been through the roof. My project already has increased, I want to say, by 15%. By being able to, um, to offer more units, I'm going to be able to offer them at a very competitive market rate. Ocean Ridge Rentals already owns um, various properties in the, the Delray Beach area that I currently rent. And I am at full capacity. I have bidding wars for new apartments that come on the market. So I see the, the demand for this product. And that's what I've kind of wanted to, um, to highlight and demonstrate tonight. Thank you, Bia. Thank you. So ha having met all the requirements of the code and offering fact-based testimony we have given substantial competent evidence shifting the burden of proof. I'm sure you will keep in mind, we all know what's, what's coming. We all know the interest that has been garnered with respect to this particular project. I'm sure you will keep in mind certain numerically determined facts, such as the infinitesimal impact of these additional units, or the factually experienced evidence of decades of harmonious existence of different types of densities. I'm sure you will adhere to your role and not place blame on a few extra units when it has to do with a school. Um, in looking at this project, uh, uh, there, there has been a lot of law about these kinds of hearings. There's, there's one that I have to mention. There's a Judge Lewis in the case of Catherine Bay versus Fagan, and it's a Florida District Court. And, and the judge said this, as, as we depart from the microphone only to have our, our, our rebuttal time. And, and the courts say this, lay witnesses may offer their views in land use cases about matters not requiring expert testimony. For example, lay witnesses may testify about natural beauty of an area because this is not an issue requiring expertise. Lay witness speculation about potential traffic problems, light and noise pollution, and general unfavorable impacts of a proposed land use are not, however, considered competent substantial evidence. Similarly, lay witness opinions that a proposed land use will devalue their homes in the area are insufficient to support a finding that such devaluation will occur. Look, that's not me. That's the language of a judge and the local Florida co courts. Um, you are sitting as quasi-judges. Um, we look forward to hearing what the general public and citizens of Delray Beach have to say. Um, we will be back here for any rebuttal or cross-examination as it may be necessary. Thank you for your attention to this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Ms. Dossery, do you have anything you would like to add? Oh, you're muted. Yes, I'm going to bring my presentation up here in a moment to run through the different criteria for consideration. One moment, please. Okay, we are reading into the record file number 2020-024 for the rezoning request for 4652 133rd Road South. So, the location, as as you um, you've gone over previously, is at 133rd Road South, west of Barwick Road, and north of the Lake Worth Drainage District L31 Canal. The um, request is for rezoning from eight dwelling units per acre to. Um, medium density, eight dwelling units per acre to medium density, uh, removing the suffix in order to, to develop a property at the fullest um, extent that the zoning designation allows, the suffix has to be removed, which is a rezoning request. And to briefly go over the project, the property history, uh, it was acquired by the city in 2005, and then uh, the city annexed it in 2007. The land use designation um, was changed to medium density, five to 12 dwelling units per acre from Palm Beach County, uh, MR5. The 
advisory land use at the time of annexation was low density, but for some reason uh, it was brought in at medium density instead of low density. And then the zoning that was assigned was medium density residential from the RM8 in Palm Beach County. The city sold the property in 2017. And um, now I'm going to go into the required information uh, for a zoning request. So section 2.4.5 says that the valid reasons for approving a change in zoning are that um, the zoning was changed in error or there's been a change in circumstance or that the requested zoning is of similar intensity, which is um, the criteria that's under discussion today. Uh, the larger question that we'll be discussing in this presentation is that while the 12 dwelling units per acre with the RM zoning is of similar intensity, the question is whether it's more appropriate for the property based on the circumstances particular to the neighborhood. So I'm going to discuss some of the surrounding developments. To the north, Bexley Park is a mix of single family and multifamily. It's um, a 54 acre development. Built out, the overall density is about 4.84 dwelling units per acre. Even though the land use is zero to five, it, it about brings it up to that, that maximum. And Country Manors to the south, a uh, 71 acre property with 448 dwelling units. The built density is about six dwelling units per acre. And to the east and west are the unincorporated county properties. They have the advisory land use of low density, but um, one thing that may be valuable for the board to consider is whether bringing or allowing this at a higher density of 12 dwelling units per acre with the change in zoning um, would then trigger uh, a rezoning of those properties if they're annexed at a at a higher density than they have now uh, above the land use that is um, the advisory land use. There are required findings for any development application, um, compatibility with the land use map, concurrency, consistency, and compliance with the LDRs. So the discussion today is going to be focusing on uh, B, C, and D. Uh, so the requested RM zoning without the um, density limiting suffix is um, compatible. The, they're consistent, I'm sorry, they're consistent. And um, the RM8, the existing zoning, would uh, provide a max build out of 25 unit dwelling units, but the proposed would provide a maximum build out of 38 dwelling units. The land use capacity, again, it would allow it to go to 38. It's the zoning that currently limits um, the build out. Related to concurrency, the water, sewer, drainage, parks, and open space and solid waste all meet the levels of service. The applicant has received a um, school capacity approval letter. And if the, um, at the time of any development application, residential dwelling units would be required to pay an impact fee for parks at $500 a dwelling unit. Traffic is um, another um, area for concurrency for this project or for this rezoning request. And again, the applicant has indicated that they have the class five site plan in for a 35 unit development, but staff looks at the max capacity or the max potential generation by the max land use. The um, Maximum potential that could be generated is 268 net external daily trips with 16 a.m. peak hour trips and 20 p.m. trips. And this is just uh, a shot of the road here in the existing conditions. And then the entrance from 33rd Road South on Barwick Road. Uh, related to the development request, not the rezoning request, um, as um, Mr. Rickards discussed, the ultimate right of way for this road due to the or pursuant to the comprehensive plan is 50 feet. So because of the conditions along the roadway now, the applicant is uh, going to be only um, paving a 25 foot 
portion of the roadway, which is uh, the existing right of way, and they're dedicating an additional 25 feet um, on their property. So the rest of the properties on this road would not be required to do any right of way dedications until the time um, a development application was submitted, but the ultimate right of way is um, 50 feet through this road. And then we have a few comprehensive plan policies here related to the um, consistency. Any development approvals must be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, NDC 1.1.3 uh, requires transitions between land uses to happen at the rear of properties or at major corridors so that there is some kind of a, um, a more compatible um, transition between properties that could uh, have a different impact. And again, the um, pursuant to NDC 1.1.7, different standards in the land development regulations, which uh, are in the RM zoning district, might limit the actual density that's achievable on the, a particular site. Policy NDC 1.1.2 is to develop remaining infill lots in residential neighborhoods that results in the same or less intense development. Um, and then policy NDC 1.1.4 um, requires all developments or redevelopments to be of a um, intensity or use or density that's appropriate for the area. So the, one of the considerations for the board will be whether or not the characteristics of the property um, render RM8 more appropriate or if RM is, is better suited for the conditions of the area. And the low density and medium density residential land use designations are designed to maintain and enhance the city's neighborhood characteristics while allowing revitalization of complementary housing types. And again, medium density is designed to provide a wide range of housing types and neighborhood amenities. So this is a quick view of the uh, surrounding land use and zoning um, to provide uh, a visual for what the surrounding neighborhoods look like. Um, the property itself, again, the land use is 5 to 12 dwelling units per acre. To the east, west, and north, the land use is 0 to 5 again. And to the south, the max density is 5 to 12 dwelling units per acre. The zoning uh, to the north, PRD, has a maximum height of 35 feet. RM, which is subject property, and the property to the south are 35 feet. And um, so those are the surrounding conditions for the, the, the neighborhood. And we have a few more policies related to the housing element of the comprehensive plan. Uh, the plan supports infill development and redevelopment of underutilized parcels uh, and efforts to maintain neighborhood integrity and quality of life in stable residential areas and a housing supply with different unit types. And again, um, the last policy here, housing or policy HOU 3.2.1 to allow a variety of housing types. So this map here shows the residential neighborhood stabilization map, which is a guide for the types of, or for uh, city, city, poli city policy making in terms of um, the types of developments that are approved in neighborhoods that are identified as stable. Um, the goal is to preserve um, the integrity of these neighborhoods and in neighborhoods um, for residents in stable neighborhoods or to avoid any new development that might decrease or negatively impact the stable condition. So there's a lot of considerations here for the board to determine whether um, this is um, appropriate based on the neighborhood conditions or whether it adds value to the type of development that surrounds the property. Section 3.2.2 of the LDRs has standards for rezoning. Two of them apply to this request. Uh, the first one is that the most residential, most restrictive residential zoning district should be applied to the subject property unless it's implementing a neighborhood plan. So RM and PRD are the preferred residential or preferred zoning districts for MD land use. Um, low density and single family residential are also compatible, but they're not preferred. So uh, a consideration here would be whether um, the restrictive zoning RM8 that is already um, 
the existing zoning is more appropriate or if RM satisfies this requirement. And then additionally, 322D rezoning shall result in land uses that are deemed compatible with adjacent and nearby land uses. So um, there are regulations, as Mr. Rickers discussed, and I'll review again in a moment, that uh, require RM properties developed in RM zoning to have some level of mitigation against development impacts when it's next to a lower density property. So again, um, anything over six dwelling units per acre is automatically um, subject to this additional review. Um, and developments requesting this greater density have to provide for traffic circulation, building placement, building setbacks, landscaping, and diverse unit types. So uh, the consideration for this would be whether or not the board feels that the uh, performance standards in RM are sufficient to mitigate any potential uh, impacts from greater density on the neighborhoods that surround the property. So uh, to go through a summary of the considerations for the rezoning request from RM8 to RM, limiting Removing the density limiting suffix to allow it to develop up to 12 dwelling units per acre would be whether the requested zoning is more appropriate for the property based on circumstances in the site or neighborhood. Whether the existing zoning designation with the suffix is the most restrictive given the development patterns that surround the property. And whether preserving the existing development patterns of the neighborhood fabric should be given precedent over the property being allowed to develop to its land use maximum. So um, at this point, um, oh, so this uh, courtesy notice was sent to the surrounding homeowner associations, and we would anticipate first and second reading in July of 2021. And you have these uh, options for board consideration, and I believe at this point um, we'll open things up for comments by the public. Chair, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. You're not. <laughs> um, thank you, Ms. Dossery. That was a great, excellent presentation um, following up Mr. Weiner's. Um, at this point, Diana, are we ready to go? Uh, do you want to take a five minute recess before we start public comment? Um, I believe we should. Okay, that would be great. Let's say um, it is 832 right now. Let's come back at 8.38 and uh, we can begin public comment if there is some. Okay. Sam, uh, just briefly before we break, Mr. Weiner, do you want the chair, uh, chairman to read the quasi-judicial rules when we come back or are you satisfied with? I, I would appreciate it if the quasi-judicial rules were read. Absolutely, Mr. Weiner. Mr. Bennett, as soon as we come back, that'll be the first thing I'll do. I'll read it into the record. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Weiner. Thank you. I'll go mute for the five minutes.
Diane. Chris, are you there? Yes, I am, Diane. Okay, give me a minute. I have to um, drop some messages in the email. So one moment. No problem. I tell you what, while you're doing that, um, I'm just going to reconvene the meeting and read the quasi-judicial rules into the record. Thank and you. if you need some more time after that, we can always take another break. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So um, I'm sorry, it was an oversight. I didn't read the quasi-judicial rules before this item, and I would like to read them at this time. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present, but agree not to speak. The city commission, board members and staff and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based upon the numbers of citizens who support or oppose, oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. Thank you. Um, Diane, just let me know if you need a little more time. No, I think we're, we're ready. Great, anytime you're ready, um, we can start going with the public comment on this item. We're off mute. Yes. Off. They can hear us. Yes. Mr. Weiner, I can hear you just so you know. <laughs> yes. So, so I, I was telling the audience, the, the, the individuals here that we are off mute. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> If it is all right with you, Chairperson Davey, and when you get rolling with the public comment, we might go on to mute because we obviously won't be interrupting it in, in any event. That would be fine. Everybody else on the board is going to mute themselves also, just so we, everybody can hear the public comment uninterrupted. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lori DeFeo. I live at 421 Bluebird Lane. There's a meeting this evening at 6 o'clock. Um, we got an ordinance number 14-21 of these zones. That's not what Delray right townhouse is, townhome, it says. Um, I am directly across from this in the canal. I, I don't like the idea of it because I just purchased here last year and paid extra for my house because of where it was located. But I have no back neighbors. Um, also, it just seems weird that this meeting is coming up and there is several homes, and I mean several, that are all abutting this, that are the, the claim shells that were shut up. And you're in a, we're in a 55 plus community. A lot of these people don't have the energy to fight this. A lot of these people don't even have the energy. They don't know. I mean, I had a hard time getting through to a voice account for, to leave the message. And I'm not even sure if this message will get to the meeting tonight. Um, they don't know where and how to deal with this. And virtual, they, half of them don't even have computers. I really feel that this is taking place at a time that 
everybody that's involved here and that will be affected by this uh, rezoning is not available comments. If you're dealing with people in their 90s and 80s here. So I feel that this needs to be stopped until everybody is available that's just the budding. They just haven't even arrived home. So their mail hasn't been forwarded to them. Just a very convenient time. Um, I'm against it. Um, obviously, I paid extra for my house. I love looking out. My bedroom's in the back. I don't want to be looking at apartment building. Um, I didn't pay the extra for my property to be looking at apartment building. Um, and that's all I got to say right now. I don't know what else to do. I don't even know if I can get on tonight. I have tried to get on virtual meetings before and cannot. So, thank you. Yes, can you, you swore me in? My name is Nancy Grondon. I live at 212 Cardinal Lane here in Delray Beach. My number is 561-596-2048. Um, I, I have a question about the um, rezoning of some of the property here. I live next to Bar uh, off Barwick and Lake Ida Road. I wanted to know what is going to happen to Barwick Road, when and if that is okayed. Uh, if somebody could get back to me, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ellen Del Greco, and I live at 3875 Staten Leaf Court in Delray Beach. That's Sable Lakes Phase 1. I am calling about the Planning Zoning Advisory Board meeting regarding the zoning of a 3.18 acre parcel on 133rd Road South on Barwick Road or off Barwick Road. And I'd like to leave some comments on my concerns. I work from home currently due to the COVID constraints and probably will continue to work remotely. The other day, or last week, I should say, I had to go and care for my friend's pets where I had to leave in the morning and come back home for a meeting. And on three occasions last week, I could not get back to my house due to the traffic on Barwick Road. I lived in, lived in this house for 20 years. I moved back here because it was beautiful back on Barwick with horse ranches and open land, only to find out that now you, you, Delray Beach City Council and whoever it is that wants to continue to build, wants to build every piece of parcel property that's available. Now including, not only did they put the Walmart up, and put housing at the end of Barwick where the horse ranches are. They're also planning to put housing at the end of the canal area. So I'd like to know from the person who is now planning to build yet another piece of parcel land, I would like for them to go and buy a piece of their property and come home, try to get home or try to leave only knowing that you cannot get anywhere because Barwick is not wide enough. I can't even imagine that you would be putting over 20 units on a road where you don't even have enough room for a two lane access pathway. And how are emergency vehicles going to get back here should there be an emergency for someone? I think the city council and I think the city of Delray Beach needs to take all this into consideration. I think this is unacceptable, and I'm very upset about this development. Thank you.
I have done sworn in. This is Kelly Soroka of 3867 Staten Lake Court regarding the zoning changes for the 3.18 acre parcel on 133rd Road. Um, I'm against the zoning changes for the parcel. In my opinion, the current zoning of eight units per acre is more than enough. I'm not sure why a variance from the current rules would be needed as the zoning restriction was in place when the developer bought the property and it's not coming as any kind of a surprise. In addition, the street is located directly across from Sable Lake, where Barwick already experiences traffic delays and backups at school drop-off and pickup times. There's no allowance for through traffic, which is already a big hassle to the local traffic trying to get home. Uh, 133rd Road itself is very narrow and would likely need adjustments to even handle 25 new units. Considering the other parcel of land on the east side of Barwick set to be starting development at some point, the increase in traffic is already going to be very significant. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joel Scott Bowling, B-O-L-L-I-N-G. I reside at 14461 Barwick Road, second house from the south with a really big pool. I oppose the rezoning of 4652 133rd Road South. Uh, the only ingress and egress that they have is 133rd. It's a 30-foot wide roadway that cannot accommodate the, the road cannot be widened anymore and just cannot accommodate um, any more traffic coming in and out of there along with Barwick Road being overtaxed because of the school uh, within the morning school being dropped off the heavy traffic and in the afternoon it basically wraps around onto the westbound side of Lake Ida picking and dropping off the children there's no infrastructure for that to be had at this point in time, I do oppose the rezoning of that property. Thank you for your time. Yes, I'm calling about agenda item 8B. My name is Dawn Translow and I live at 4122 Satin Leaf Court, Delray Beach, Florida, 33445. That is in the community of Sable Lakes. My understanding is that they want to build uh, condos right off a very small road that is across from the exit to our intersection. Living here and having the school traffic, I know how hard it is to get out of the development every morning. We were once told to use the south exit to leave to make the flow easier. There has never been a policeman there to help us cross. It is more dangerous than coming out from the north. I don't know how we'll get out safely if we have more traffic coming in now what would be a four-way intersection. I'm opposed to this. I think that a road out for that new community should be found off military. Thank you very much for listening to my opinion. Yes, I have been sworn in. I'm Lawrence Andre at 1325 East R. Wick Ranch Circle, Delray Beach. I have been a resident of Delray since July of 1978. And I'm calling about the 133rd uh, parcel. And I do townhouses. Uh, we have enough townhouses. We have enough people. You've ruined downtown. You've ruined the entire city of Delray Beach. Uh, my grandparents have been here, were here back in the 20s and 30s. 
But my family has been here for a lot of years, and they would not recognize it, unfortunately, not for the good, all for the bad. So I do not favor more townhouses. I do not favor more development of land. We have enough, and enough is enough. Stop trying to build on every single vacant space. We have enough. Stop. Bye. Uh, yes, this is Connie Andre. I am at 1325 East Barwick Ranch Circle, and I am calling about the rezoning of 133rd Road. Uh, yes, I do not agree with this. How many more condos and everything do we need in this damn town? You have destroyed this town. The downtown you don't even want to go to anymore, and there's at least some quietness out here and now you want to go ahead and add more houses if there is an inch of land you want to destroy it god forbid if we are just to have some land for a change thank you I was sworn. My name is Michael Hurwitz. I'm at 4021 Satin Leaf Court, Delray Beach, Florida, 33445. Um, and uh, I'm really concerned um, about density in the area around Banyan Creek Elementary. Uh, living in Sable Lake, we deal with a tremendous amount of traffic uh, during uh, school, getting in and school, getting out, and adding more homes upon more homes upon more homes is going to make um, a small road. Uh, on Barwick, um, even more difficult to get through. And um, I just don't feel like we have the ability to really handle uh, more homes. I understand uh, it's already been approved for 25 new homes. Um, and uh, I think that's 25 too many, uh, but it's there and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, but we can mitigate the overall population uh, that the area uh, can handle. Uh, so I strongly encourage and highly urge everybody to uh, deny uh, the rezoning from 25 to 36 um, and, and keep this area um, uh, traffic wise as, as minimal a footprint as possible because it's already terrible here. Thanks so much. My name is Patrice Marchanti. I live at 3901 Satin Leaf Court, and I would like to comment on the 3.18 acre parcel on 133rd Road South. It is being attempted to be rezoned for 25 to 36 townhomes on a little tiny road that feeds into Barwick, we already have in Sable Lakes, Banyan Creek Elementary, which creates a traffic hazard every single day. Now, where pathways used to be on Barwick Road, they're going to build a new development. We haven't even felt the effects of that. I can't imagine Barwick Road being able to handle any more traffic than it already does. There are so many people cutting through from Atlantic over to Walmart, to military. It's, it's dreadful. It's dreadful. I don't understand how 
that little tiny road can be widened and it's going to be a hazard, a hazard for every family who already lives here. Very disappointing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Calvano. I live at uh, 4560 South Barwick Grand Circle uh, in the development Barwick Estate here off Barwick Road. And I just calling to voice um, the uh, to uh, oppose that zoning request for 4552 133rd Road South, which is uh, labeled the Delray Townhomes. Um, problem I see here is the egress and uh, ingress of uh, 133rd Road is so so narrow. Uh, I I back that, and, uh, and it's just easy. Yesterday, there were 60 vehicles that went in and out of there, and that's just for tip-top tree service. So I, I don't see how you could uh, put all those uh, uh, townhomes in there. Uh, so I'm, I'm totally against the... Uh, rezoning it uh it doesn't really say what um you can get on what it's zoned for now but rm8 which would probably be okay so anyway phone number uh my name is peter calvano phone number 561-573-2258 thank you Hi, my name is Erin Cassidy. My address is 1670 Satin Leaf Court, Delray Beach 33445. I'm calling about the proposed zoning change for 133 for 133 South um, to change the parcels. And it's the it's the road that's across the entrance from the phase four Sable Lakes development. I'm calling um regarding to protest this and um, because of the traffic at Banny Creek Elementary and in our Sable Lakes development. So um, please vote no for this zoning change. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bob Olson, last name spelled A-L-S-A-N, Bob Olson. I live at 4525 North Barwick Ranch Circle in Delray Beach, Florida. Um, and I was sworn in, I listened to the message and yes. Um, so my uh, comment is regarding the 133rd Road South, uh, changing of the zoning to a higher density and I'm against that. The reason is I've lived here um, on Barwick Road uh, for nine years now and uh, during school season it gets overly crowded as it is if we do have a higher density at the 133rd road south um, specifically it's just going to um, inhibit travel so unless the road is going to be widened barwick road that is unless that's widened which i don't think that's possible with some of the homes and the bridges um, but if that's not possible then i really am against the 133rd road south um, thank you very much. Again, this is Bob Olson. Yes, my name is Beverly Wilson. I live at 1640 Satin Reef Court in Delray Beach. Uh, this is in regards to uh, the uh, zoning 
change at the 133 South Road uh, off Barwick Road in Delray Beach. Uh, I've been a 26-year resident of Sable Lakes Phase 1. My children had attended Banyan Creek Elementary School. The only time at that point there was ever an issue with the traffic was if it rained and parents would drive to the school to pick up the students. Now we have to make sure that we don't leave or coming back to our home with the traffic at drop off and pick up at Banyan Creek Elementary School. It's been a nightmare already and with the already approved new development of 40 additional single family homes at Banyan Cove said to be started in six to eight months. I just can't even imagine what the impact of those additional vehicle traffic will be. Also, emergency services to our area will be impacted as well. And there's standstill traffic at Barwick Road at this time. These undeveloped properties should be kept as single family homes to maintain the integrity of the surrounding neighborhood and not to be used as a tax base. Residents' priorities should be over money. Thank you again. My name is Beverly Wilson, 561-706-8757. Thank you and have a great day. Hello, I'm Rose Marie Agata at 1610 Satin Leaf Court in Delray Beach from Sable Lakes. I'm calling you about the three acre lot on 133rd Road here in Delray. Please keep the density down to eight units per acre. Even that is awful for us. We are eight neighborhoods emptying onto Barwick and traffic is disaster. Many accidents and deaths have occurred on this road already. This is all single family, quiet neighborhoods. The traffic is already a major, major problem. Please help us. Thank you for listening. Hello, this is Carol Anderson, uh, 4812 West Bexley Park Drive. I am commenting on the proposed rezoning of uh, housing block on South 133rd Street. My comment is that I expect housing to be developed there, but the road, 133rd Street, is totally inadequate for any kind of vehicular traffic beyond the little bit that it receives now. It is too narrow, and there's no way to widen it. So to put houses back there expecting that the residents will go and come on that street is inviting disaster. Therefore, any approval of housing in that area should require a connection directly to Barwick Road through the adjoining properties and not try to use 133rd Street. Thank you. Uh, yes, I was sworn in. My name is Lucille. Last name is Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And um, I live at 4530 South Barwick Ranch Circle in Delray Beach. I'm calling regarding the um, property that might be built on um, 4652 133rd Road South. It is my home is right on the road of that 133rd South. And um, I wanted to state my objection to building on that road or anywhere nearby. Okay, thank you.
This message is from Elsa and Fleming Johansen, 4520 South Barbie Grand Circle. We are absolutely against large future development on 133rd Road. There is already too much traffic on Barbic and on 133rd Road. Thank you. Yes, hi. I have been sworn in. My name is Melanie Stallard. I live at 4040 Seagrape Circle, Delray, Florida, 33445. <clears throat> and I'm, I know Monday is a planning and zoning board for item 8B, which is a plot of land on 133rd Road South. And they are um, owners wanting to change the zoning to get higher density. As it stands, um, there's already, you know, eight dwelling, eight dwelling units. We have a school that's located on this road. It's almost impossible to get from our community to the community during school hours and the road, the traffic on the road is horrendous as is. I don't believe, you know, Barwick can withstand any more development. Um, it's overcrowded. Uh, there's, you know, high theft in the area. My car personally has gotten stolen out of my driveway. Um, you know, you, we love the quaintness of the neighborhood. That's why we bought in here. Um, again, I just don't think that that road can handle any more traffic, especially with all the students walking to and from. It's so dangerous as it is with people zipping up and down the road. So please, please reconsider making it any higher density than it already is because we already have a proposed 40 units coming into that road and an additional 30 will be just it's just a small one small road so please reconsider um i know myself and a lot of us neighbors do not want this so thank you for taking the time to listen to my concerns thank you Yes, my name is Jill Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S. -S. I'm calling about the rezoning request on 133 Road South. I am a Sable Lakes resident, 1655 Fern Forest Place. Um, I am very concerned that this um, new project is not good for the area. Um, there are lots of children at a bus stop near there in the morning. The area in question is very dangerous in the morning. And I don't know when they do traffic studies for these areas that you want to build near this area, but they need to do traffic studies while school is letting in and out. Not during the summer, which is when I notice you do most of your traffic studies. Um, it is awful. You cannot, I can't even get in and out of my neighborhood. When I get out, let's say I left something at home, like my phone, or if it's emergency back at my house, I can't even get back into my own neighborhood. So I can't even imagine if you put another neighborhood near this school, the traffic it's going to cause, and you have nobody directing traffic. There's there's high school students, middle school students standing at a bus stop right near where you're projecting this project to be. It, it is not good. It's not a good thing. If you're going to have a project, make it small, make a very few homes. This area cannot take this much housing. So I just wanted to share my opinion. Um, I've lived in my home for 19 years. I see what is happening is it is awful. But do traffic studies during school hours, letting in, letting out, see the traffic. It is unbearable. You can't even get out of section four, which they said it's going to be right across section four. I live in section one. 
but section four, they have no one directing traffic. You can't get in and out. Um, and I'm sure when you live down Bexley Park, it's hard to get in and out of there. The traffic backs up. You it, you can't. You need to do something about all the traffic if you're going to build multiple um, residences near that Barwick Road. It's unsafe. If someone's sick, emergency. It, it's not not good at all. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. Hello, my name is Catherine Carpenin. I was sworn in and I live at 1150 West Magnolia Circle in Delray Beach, Florida. I'm calling concerning the agenda for the plot of city land on 133rd Road South. As a resident of Sable Lakes community for the last three years, I have enjoyed, my husband and I and our six-year-old son have enjoyed taking a little walk to the lake and the park in Bexley Park and walking down that little dirt road of 133rd Road South. It is a road that um, many people use to get to the park, many families and children, and thankfully it has been a safe, small road with very little car traffic to walk on. We enjoy the nature and the walk there, and it, it just means so much to our family to be able to enjoy the beauty and the quiet um, and having a little place like that to escape to right next to our own communities. So we would be really distressed to hear that that would be um, developed to accommodate so many more residents, so much more traffic um, at a higher density. And um, can't imagine how that little residential walk area could accommodate more. And we really feel it would be um, a detriment to our beautiful little community and our little ability to escape and enjoy some nature. Thank you for considering this as you consider this on the Planning and Zoning Board agenda for Monday night. Goodbye. Hi, my name is Susan Rogers. I live at 1375 Sable Lakes Road. And I wanted uh, to go on record that I oppose the uh, proposed increase of density on the 133rd Road off of Barwick. Um, there's way too many cars on there now. I can't imagine if there is a larger development, and um, I definitely oppose it. Thank you. Bye. Hello, my name is Evan Rosenbaum. My address is 1165 East Magnolia Circle, Delray 33445. I'm calling in regards to the um, new zoning proposition that's planned off Barwick Road. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, meeting about new zoning for a plot of land on 133rd Road South. Um, there's a concern by myself and a lot of others that adding this dip, 
uh, um, changing the zoning and adding this many units to this area is going to bring so much traffic to to this road where we have so many children. There's an elementary school. Our neighborhood is full of children that are constantly crossing Barwick Road, um, adding 36 townhomes in this small amount of land. It doesn't really make sense for uh, the area that it is as well. We only have single family homes all up and down Barwick Road. And this would be the first multifamily structures that are uh, just north of uh, Lake Ida on Barwick Road. And just the traffic that the school brings already in the mornings and the afternoons uh, is adding this many more units adding you know multiple cars per unit and i can just imagine how much density it's going to cause on barwick road um i love delray i love living here i love living off barwick um and my neighborhood but i one of the reasons i love it is because of the surrounding area i don't think this is going to bring any type of positivity to the area other than more density, more cars, more traffic, and, you know, just more, more business. We're, we're an area that we have lots of children and lots of families that constantly cross the road. And it's just, we're, I'm concerned that because the owner wants to rezone obviously to make more of a profit and sacrifice, sacrifice the area around to all the residents that live there. So just wanted to voice my opinion on this. I'm strongly against it. I hope you do hear it. I hope it hears, uh, reaches the right, uh, right people. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Hi there, I was sworn in. My name is Michelle Zadurko. I live at 3730 Riverside Way, Delray Beach, Florida. The um, item on the agenda is the Banyan Creek Project rezoning. I just wanted to leave my statement um, and say that I'm against the rezoning for the building of townhomes across from our community. It would cause a lot more traffic, um, unwanted traffic that we see due to the school traffic in the morning and the afternoon. Um, also being a very small road, one way in and one way out, it would cause traffic there. Also overwhelming the school with more students. Um, we also realize that there's lots of litter on Barwick Road due to the foot traffic of the students there. So that would also make that worse. They're already adding homes north of the school um, on Barwick Road over there where there's some empty vacant lots. So um, I think that adding these 33 towns townhomes would not be beneficial to the area, causing a lot more traffic, as mentioned. Um, it would be nice if it was rezoned for farmland or that usage, so how you, know, you could possibly get fresh produce. Um, I'm sure that's something else entirely. But like I said, rezoning for more homes is not beneficial to our community at this time and the resale value of our house so i would appreciate it if it was not rezoned for that thanks so much bye bye Hello, I was just sworn in. My name is Michael Danis. I'm a resident 
of Fable Lakes at 3730 Riverside Way. I'm calling uh, regarding the Banyan Cove project. Uh, there's a zoning board meeting coming up, and this is reference to the land at 133rd Road South. Uh, I'm calling to say that I am against this proposed project. This is not a good idea for the existing community. The road is way too small and unsafe to bring traffic coming through this. There's already too much traffic on Barwick Road. Um, there's a littering problem as well on Barwick Road due to foot traffic and lack of uh, garbage disposals. Uh, adding 33 to 35 townhomes on that uh, street and um, in that area is just a terrible idea for the resale value of our current homes and the community uh, living uh, the quality of life that we have. So I'm against this project and I ask that you not um, go forward with the approval of rezoning this property in favor of the multi-unit project. Thank you very much. Audrey Kirsch, 12704 Coral Lakes Drive, Boynton Beach, Florida. I was sworn in, and I need to make a statement stating that I am against any increase in zoning for higher density at 4652 133rd Road South. I'm on that strip frequently and we cannot handle any more traffic. It will present a danger to cyclists, walkers, um, children, and I hope, I hope the planning board will not prevent a higher density in that area. We're trusting you to do what is right for the community. Thank you. Jerry M, 1210 East Lancewood, Playful Lakes, opposed to 8B, higher density, meaning more traffic on Barwick Road. Thank you. Hi, this is Cynthia Younghands, J-U-N-G-H-A-N-S. I reside at 4780 Glen Pine Lane, Boynton Beach, 33436. I'm off Coconut Lane, which dead ends at Barwick Road. I'm calling about item 8B. I'm calling on behalf of the Cocoa Pines HOA. I'm on the board. Coco Pines is more than concerned about additional development utilizing Barwick Road. As it is between the school buses, the school traffic, and normal congestion, it's the way most people from the west area of Boynton Beach travel to downtown Delray because it cuts off a section of Lake Ida and it's impossible going down Atlantic to get to downtown Atlantic Avenue. So most people cut down flavor picks, it turns into coconut as it crosses military. You hang a right on Barwick, you hang a left on Lake Ida, and you've saved almost 10 minutes. Sometimes I'm on Barwick four to five times a day, and I'm not the only one. We are very 
to any additional increase in homes in uh, item 8B. There's no way Barwick Road can handle it. I know you know part is owned by the county, part is owned by the city. The other problem is, and I'm unable to attend on Monday, I have photographs of fire and rescue unable to travel Barwick Road because of the traffic from the school. If you need emergency equipment getting to your home between certain hours, it's not going to happen. So adding additional density is going to make it a bigger nightmare. So I please ask you to respect the voices of the community and to please not approve the increase in density. Thank you. Oh, I was sworn in. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary, and my husband is Anthony Zioli, and we live at 1345 West Barwick Ranch Circle in Barwick Estates in Delray Beach. Um, I'd like to comment on the Delray, Delray Townhomes Ordinance Number 14-21 rezoning. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the impact that the additional traffic for the 35 townhomes is going to have on Barwick Road. Right now, it's only a two-lane road, and we experience a lot of heavy traffic in the mornings and the afternoons due to the school and people picking up and dropping off kids. An additional 70-plus cars might be um, might happen because of the 35 units, and that's, that's what I'm concerned with. Maybe an alternate use of the property should be considered. Thank you. My name is Christine Kiefer. I live at 4538 Danson Way, Delray Beach, Florida, 33445. I'm calling to do a um, comment on agenda item 8B. I was sworn in and I agree and attest to the swearing in. I am calling to go against them doing the development. This is our community right here in Bexley. I live right here. Um, and they're planning on, this road is only about 17 to 22 foot wide and they want to make it for two lane traffic and add about 40 homes on an empty lot. That is a lot of traffic back in here. We all have animals, we have children, um, the extra cars, the extra traffic would just be uh, terrible for our area. There is not enough room for that. Um, there's already a lot of accidents around here and it would just create a very dangerous situation and overcrowding. So I am calling again, Christine Kiefer, against agenda item 8B. Thank you. Yes, I'm sworn in. My name is Diane Gerino. I live in Sable Lakes in Delray Beach. The address is 3795 Riverside Way, Delray, 33445. And this is in regards to item 8B, building 40 homes um, between Barwick Road and Bexley Park. Um, there is a small narrow road leading into Bexley Park and I know of the area that you're speaking. I often walk down that road into Bexley Park which is a beautiful pond. Um, I literally walk my cat there in a stroller, gives me exercise and gives him a more interesting life. And no, I am against 40 homes in that area. I can understand there being a need for homes, but not that that density at all. Thank you very much. Goodbye.
Hi, my name is Kristen Galvan. I officially have been sworn in. I'm calling from 1471 West Bexley Park Drive, Delray Beach, Florida, in the community of Bexley Park. And I am calling regarding a possible approval of a development of about 40 homes that would sit close to Bexley Park um, and on a road that is used frequently by myself, my toddler, my family, my dogs. Um, it's 133 or 193rd Road South that sits in between Bexley Park and goes out to Barwick. Um, I just want to add my comments that I strongly oppose this development. Um, there's already another development that has been approved on the east side of Barwick, where actually a lot of our peacocks hang out during the day, which is very upsetting to me. Um, I don't even plan on driving down Barwick to see that development take place. But I would just strongly disapprove of a development coming that close to Bexley with that tiny of a road where pedestrians and children and parents walk their school or kids to school every morning from Bexley Park um, to and from school and really just around our general area. So it's a very tiny road. I can't imagine two-way traffic going back and forth on that road. Um, anyway, so hopefully my opinion matters and it counts. All right, my phone number is 561-715-6996. If anyone needs to call me back, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm going to comment on agenda item 8B. My name is Rebecca Kurinsky. Last name is K-U-R. I am like Mary, S like Sam, K-I. I I am, uh, my, my home address is 1430 West Bexley Park Drive, Delray Beach, Florida. Sorry, my phone keeps ringing on the other line. Zip code is 33445. Um, I, just wanted to call and say that uh, my family and I were not in favor of the development on the road uh, right next to our house it is I believe 40 homes that are going in and they're gonna change the street over there we use that street a lot to get across safely over to Barwick and get to the park and we're not in favor of it thank you Hi, this is Ingrid Lee. I was sworn in. I reside at 1441 East Bexley Park Drive in Delray Beach. I live adjacent to the property that is on the agenda for uh, 8B, 4652 133rd Road South. Um, they are requesting a change in zoning so that they could switch to RM, which would allow them to go from 25 units up to 38 units on that about three acre property. Um, yeah, so there's a lot to say. One is that we're not going to get a workforce benefit from increasing this density. The second uh, issue is that um, it mentioned in the staff report that there needs to be three valid reasons for having this change. First two do not apply. They're saying the third one does apply, um, that the requested zoning is a similar intensity allowed under the land use map, and that it is more appropriate for the property based upon circumstances particular to the site and or neighborhood. I would argue it is not more appropriate to add density to that particular property. As you go through the staff report further down, it talks about the width of the road. Um, 
the sur- and also the surrounding properties. The surrounding development, Bexley Park, is a low density with um, up to five dwelling units per acre. Country uh, Acres is not manor, excuse me, is not using their density to the full amount. Um, they're at six dwelling units per acre. Um, recently, it mentions also that the Bandon Cove was put in place down the road, and they also had to reduce their density after a uh, public outcry. So I would argue that it does not meet that third um, valid reason for why it should be allowed. Also, um, the traffic from, if you look at the traffic report for it, is also really high currently. There's only a handful of trucks that go up and down that road from the last uh, occupant on that road. Um, That's actually a county lot right before you get to Bexley Park. Uh, There's otherwise no traffic really on that road. So going from that to almost 300 trips a day would be ludicrous. It is used mainly as a pedestrian walk for people from Bexley Park to go to school. So you're talking about school children being on that road. Um, People who go for walks to walk their dogs, take bike rides. A lot of people use that area. So you're taking a narrow road. You're putting 300 car trips on it. Um, The report also says that the width is 17 foot to 22 foot currently. And they're recommending that it be uh, 18 feet of travel, 9 feet both ways, and 5 feet for a sidewalk plus swale. That's 23 feet. Where is 5 feet going to materialize if the narrowest part of the road is 17 feet? It really can't do Excuse me, Diane. If that was the end of that message, could you pause it for one moment, please? No, it stopped. She ran out of time. Oh, she ran out of time. Great. Yes. If you could just pause that one second. Um, yes, Mr. Bennett. Sir. Can you hear me, Mr. Bennett? Yes, I'm here. Yes. I wanted to ask you, um, we've been listening to public comment here for about an hour. Um, I'm not crazy in saying that it's kind of repetitive. We're hearing the same things over and over again, and it's basically one-sided view. Um, how much, like, I have no idea how much public comment is left. I know the city commission can end it after an hour. We Right. So you're talking about section, um, six of the local rules that were adopted by city commission, um, specifically yes. subsection F, which is a lot of time. And that section states that when there are 20, um, or more people that desire to speak on the same or related subject. Um, the board can establish a time limit not to exceed one hour for public comment. So it, it is a board decision. So as a group, you guys would have to um, memorialize that consensus. I'm not sure how much we have left. Um, Diane, do you have any uh, that information for the board? Okay. I mean, if it's another just couple of points, please, Diane. Yep. Okay. We are almost done with the comments from um, April's meeting. We haven't even hit the new comments yet that came in for this meeting. So what you're telling me is we still have the comments from last meeting and we haven't even started on the ones that came in for this one. Correct. Oh boy. Um, Let me, uh, Mr. Weiner, Mr. Weiner. Can you hear me? No. I, you must be muted. <laughs> I'm back off of mute. Okay, Mr. Weiner, thank you. Um, you've heard my back and forth with uh, Ms. Miller and Mr. Bennett. Do you have any objection if the board was to decide not to hear uh, the rest of the public comment? I, unfortunately, the applicant has no position with respect to hearing public comment. I think everyone understands we want due process for everyone involved. And um, that means that we can only have the position of saying that we do not comment on this portion of of the uh, uh, proceedings and we'll let you make your own decision. Chairman, I I would echo uh, Mr. Weiner's comment because this is really the rules established by the city. Um, this really isn't something that Mr. Weiner 
really should opine on, so I appreciate that position as well. So it's really up to the board. Um, you, of course, can can decide to listen to them all if you are so inclined. Um, but if at this point you want to proceed with the one hour limitation, you know, probably should be at least a brief board discussion and and probably a formal motion as well. Sure. Let me uh, take it to my colleagues. Um, I asked my colleagues, would you like to continue hearing public comment or is anybody in favor of going into board discussion now? Mr. Like Brady, to make if I may, I think that at the advisory board, I think we should adopt the local rules the city commission already follows. I don't think that that's out of line or, or unreasonable. My, and I'd like friend. to make the most of the exercise that. Okay, just, just before we get into a motion for it, I just, if anybody does object to it, Ms. Morrison, I'd just like to give them the opportunity to. Um, so just please hold your motion. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Long, Ms. Ms. Howell, Mr. Weinberg, do you have any thoughts on this? Mr. Chair, I, I support your uh, proposal of following the city commission's rules on this. Okay. I support as well. Mr. Long, thank you. Mr. Weinberg, Mr. Zeller. Yes, I support that. Record, okay. For the record, I've been keeping a tally. Me too. Kept, so, 34. 34 people. 34 yeah. people um, who have testified, and much of it, much of it was repetitive. If if we appeared in person, we would have the right to suggest to the people who who were lined up to testify that if they had something repetitive to say, then thank you. If there's something new to say, then we would hear that, but unfortunately we don't, so I support that motion as well. Great. Um, thank, thank all of you, and Ms. Morrison, please go ahead. There was a motion by Ms. Morrison. Yeah, I'm making a motion that after hearing 34 uh, voiced oppositions that we uh, exercise our right to hold public a uh, comment to over one hour. We've been at, been at it one hour and 40 minutes. One hour and 20 minutes, I'm sorry. No, it's one hour. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Howell. Ms. Miller, Diane, if you don't mind calling the roll, please. Joy Howell. Yes. Alan Zeller. Yes. Julian Blankenship. Yes. Max Weinberg. Yes. Rob Long. Yes. Christina Morrison. Yes. Chris Davy. Yes. And Chris, can I just say one thing that um, I also have been watching the clock and it has been um, one hour. I thought it was just one hour from when we came yeah. back from recess. Yeah, it's only been one hour. It hasn't okay, been sorry. That's what I had marked down myself. It was 34 comments in one hour. Um, great. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. And uh, I'll ask my colleagues on the board, does anybody want to take a five minute recess to just stretch your legs before we go into uh, cross examination um, by the applicant and staff and board discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair, that's a great yes, idea. Please, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect, I'll see everybody back in five minutes and we Chair, can move just, into the next uh, sorry, segment. Thank you. Chair, just want to briefly say uh, before we break, I should be able to laugh. Uh, the rule is is really about um, the amount of time, and I think it was very established by the board that it was more than 20 comments, as indicated in the rules, and that we've hit the one hour mark. So, regardless of Content. pro or opposition, um, you know, really was about 20 people. More than 20 people have commented, and we've reached the one hour mark. So, perfect, Mr. Bennett. Great. Thank you so much. I do have a question, Mr. Bennett, before you disappear. Yes. What, do we have to formally not write this minute at some point? Should we like accept the local rules as part of the board, or is that just like a, a standard that just applies? 
So you, usually the board has a, a set of bylaws and the bylaws adopt the local rules. Um, mm -hmm. I would need to just double check when this board last adopted the bylaws, but I believe the bylaws just generically adopt the local rules, not a okay. specific set of local rules. Um, but this being the local rules adopted by the city commission, you know, I feel confident the board has, has exercised their right underneath them as they're allowed to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. See everybody back in five.
Okay, okay, Diane. Are we is everybody back? I see. I think they're coming back. Everybody's back. I'm sure, Mr. Long will be joining us in a moment. Hey, I'm seeing everybody's back. It is 9.57 p.m. Delray Beach Planning and Zoning Board meeting of May 17th, 2021 is reconvening. Uh, Mr. Weiner, we're going to go to you and do you have any rebuttal or cross-examination for Ms. Dasarik? Um, yes, and, and under the rules, cross-examination is, is different than rebuttal. I'd like to begin with some cross-examination. It really isn't a cross-examination as much as I'd like Ms. Dasari to go back to her program. I have a a couple of, of items on her PowerPoint that I'd like to see again. Is that possible, Rebecca? Sure. Do you know what slides? Um, I don't know the numbers, but one of them was 2.4.5. You gave the three reasons for the zoning and, and, and uh, you had ours underlined. Could you go to that? Mm -hmm. I think Just it's slide number five. Uh, uh, yeah, it says what I thought it said. So it says that the requested zoning is of a similar intensity as allowed under the land use map. I've read that correctly. Yes. Sorry, let me let me um, let me uh, switch which screen I'm sharing with one, please. Okay. I shared the wrong one. one. All right. So that last paragraph, it says that the requested zoning is of similar intensity as allowed under the land use map, right? Correct. Okay. Now, could you go later? You had a you had a a, a matrix or a table. Um, I think it was in connection with three point two point two. Let's see. Now, let's scroll down a little further. Yes. Um, oh, sorry, let me go back. Oh, yeah, back. I think it's going right. back. And oh. so am I reading this right? Under 3.2.2a, you say RM and PRD are the preferred zoning district for MD land use. That's what I'm reading? That is correct. That's from the Comprehensive Plan Table NDC 1 in the Neighborhoods District and Corridors element. Say yes or no if I'm reading it correctly. You can get a chance to cross-examine me. I was both a fact witness and a presenter if you like, but I was just asking you what it said. So I, I, I reread it and that's that's what I wanted. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Sure. That's all my cross-examination. And we're here to be cross-examined if you have any, Rebecca. Yes, Ms. Dashri, do you have any cross-examination for Mr. Weiner's team? No cross-examination, just a, a brief clarification. Uh, with the rezoning requests, we always want to make sure that if there's a development proposal associated with it, that we draw attention to the fact that the consideration is for the request itself, not any development proposal. So while the applicant has represented a desire to develop it with 35 townhome units, the uh, rezoning would allow it to develop up to a maximum of 38. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Ms. Dasri. Noted. And I'm sure my colleagues made note of it as well. 11 units to the acre would get us to 35. Mr. Weiner? Uh, are, are we are we ready for rebuttals? Typically, yes, the, you the are. applicant has. Well, does um, does uh, Ms. Dasri have any rebuttal? Typically, we're allowed to have the last word. No, only that clarification that I just gave. All right, it looks like you might be done with us. Um, first of all, thank you for such a deliberate um, deliberations and 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 for for uh, listening to each side and, and uh, uh, listening to these proposals. This is a very important issue for Delray Beach, Florida. It really is. 
Um, if I might, because I know you don't like when I read for, about judges or uh, what judges have to say. Let me, let me read something from an article called Higher Density, Math and, and, and Fact. And this is the Sierra Club and the Urban Land Institute. Low density sprawl takes an enormous toll on our air, water, and land. The United States is now losing a staggering 2 million acres of land a year to haphazard sprawling development. It is inefficient land use, not economic growth, that accounts for the rapid loss of open space and farms. Low density sprawl compromises the resources that are at the core of the community's economy and character. I didn't write it. Judges didn't write it. Sierra Club wrote it. Urban Land Institute wrote it. So, so let's get back. I mean, we, we heard about the majority of the calls, and, and we know full well where they stand in terms of being evidence. But we honestly want to engage those people who are in the public, and we understand their needs, and this has nothing to do with the fact that we've already met all of the requirements in terms of substantial competent evidence, so that you know that we are not disregarding the community. Let me say a few things quickly. First of all, we are going to improve emergency vehicle access. We are going to be improving 133rd Road. Um, we'll be improving it all the way down to Barwick. It will be there and it will be placed um, in, a, in a condition with sustainable pervious concrete at a cost of more than $125,000. Now, I know what Rebecca says, you're not supposed to really consider the site plan. The SPRAD board will beat us up. We all know what the SPRAD board does. But our zoning, the way we do this local zoning code, it requires that you take a look at this. We didn't purposely want to give you all this information. If you take a look at the requirements, we are supposed to hop over. The burdens we are supposed to meet, you have to know that it is possible to do what we say we're going to do in order to reach the conclusion that we are more appropriate. Which leads us to that last question. Yes, we are appropriate. We are more appropriate under the standards. Because remember, and we just saw it in Rebecca's report, this is about land use. This is about the comprehensive plan. This isn't about that moment at the school when somebody's backed up in traffic. And by the way, in that hour that you heard, we would have had approximately three cars leave because of the additional density, one every 20 minutes. And quite honestly, that's in peak hours. The school is 2.30 to 4 before peak hours. We probably would have had one car come out. Now, let's talk about appropriate. So we talk about appropriate in terms of the comprehensive plan. That is your guidepost. And what does it say? Provide a complementary mix of land uses. We prove that three places in Delray where they are complementary. In fact, the single family homes have done better than the single family homes in this area. And they've done so for decades. Provide transition between land use designations. Have you heard the word same? That's not anywhere in the code. You haven't heard the word that it must be exact. You've heard the word similarity. Why? They want you to carry out the comprehensive plan and provide transition. Establish maximum density, measured in dwelling units per gross acre for residential land use and misuse designations. Again, in the comprehensive plan. Encourage affordable goods and services. Fulfill remaining land use needs. That's the comprehensive plan. A wide range of housing choices. If this is appropriate to a wide range of housing choices. Create and maintain residential neighborhoods with a wide range of housing types with associated neighborhood amenities. That's what we will be doing. Now look, you try to cut this down. Do you think $125,000 for a whole roadway can be afforded if you cut it down? But that isn't even the standard. I understand that's a site plan problem and that's a SPRAB problem. What is your problem here tonight? Your problem here tonight is to understand that you are looking for the people who haven't spoken tonight. Those eight additional families that could move into Delray Beach, Florida. And nobody has said, none of your comprehensive plan. There is no charge to say, cut off the population. Let's keep it at the same. There isn't that charge. Instead, there's a charge to make a more welcoming community, to make a community that does allow for these variations. 
They don't use the word same, and you shouldn't be using the word same to consider now. Under those circumstances, overwhelmingly, we are carrying out the comprehensive plan on our the most appropriate for this particular uh, piece of property. Under those circumstances, I ask for your further deliberation. I'm hoping you see the wisdom of this for the whole of Delray Beach, Florida, and for those eight families who someday you'll welcome here and who will be part of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Okay. Um, Mr. Weiner, I just want to be clear. That um, concluded your rebuttal, correct? Yeah, I could go on for hours, but it's done. <laughs> I don't think anybody oh. really wants to hear me. And you look too far too comfortable. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> I'm in the quiet part of my house. <laughs> At any rate, um, with that being said, uh, let's move it off to board discussion and uh, which one of my colleagues wants to speak first? Mr. Davey, I would be thrilled to speak first. Go ahead, Ms. Blankenship. There you go. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, just as a point of clarification, um, the uh, representation for the applicant characterized the infinitesimal impact as a fact. Uh, infinitesimal impact is not a fact. It's a subjective characterization, just for the record. Um, because I, as you can hear from all of the public comments, I don't believe any of the impact of this is, is considered infinitesimal in any way. Um, and it certainly is an infinitesimal to how we feel we should uh, you know, consider this item before us this evening. Uh, I'll start with, since Mr. Weiner went back to the section that we're supposed to be looking for, and uh, the LDR section 2.4.5 D5, uh, the third consideration. Um, that the requested zoning is of similar intensity as allowed under the land use map, but the operative word there is and, and that it is more appropriate for the property based upon circumstances particular to the site and or neighborhood. It doesn't say or, it says and, so it really has to meet both of those um, requirements. And in my view, uh, we, we start having concerns um, right off the bat, NDC 1.1.12, the same or less intense, less intensity, NDC 1.1.14, use intensity and density and, and, and density to the adjacent properties. NDC 1.2, maintain and enhance neighborhood character. Housing element 2.1.4, maintain neighborhood stability and integrity. All of those speak to this RM8 designation that it currently has. Now, from my understanding, um, the applicant presented in their testimony that RM8 and RM are the same. Well, I can see that other than the fact that our code speaks specifically to RM designations that have a suffix. And that is presented in our staff report um, on page seven, LDR section 4.4.68, special regulations the density for a specific RM development may be further limited by a numerical suffix affixed to the designation and shown on the zoning map. To seek a density greater than allowed by the suffix, it's necessary to rezone the property. Now, if they were the same, we wouldn't be here discussing rezoning. Um, and so it, it also speaks to performance standards, which are part of that. So section 4.4.6, I1, performance standards, relates to traffic circulation, and as we've heard, you know, I, the, the traffic circulation is, is not appropriate for the site. So I would like clarification from staff on the 133rd Road South. Um, it was my understanding from hearing the applicant's testimony and, and reading uh, the, the staff report that there was going to be some mitigation to the roadway. So, Mr. Sari, um, could we discuss 133rd Road South, please? Yes, let me go back in the presentation here. So the mitigation that will be required, and that this is you what know, we've just asked you not to consider the um, site plan that is under uh, review currently, but as part of that site plan approval, there are, is um, some improvements that will be required. I'm sorry, it's taking me a moment to get back to that. Uh, okay, so the property itself is required to dedicate um, 50 feet of right of way. Um, 
The ultimate right of way per the comp plan for local roads is 50 feet. So that's the reason for the dedication. The existing uh, roadway width is 25 feet. There's only about, um, I think it's 13 to 22 feet of pavement. Um, paved road currently and the rest is unimproved uh, swales on the side. But the um, existing roadway is enough to accommodate two nine foot travel lanes and a five foot sidewalk within the existing 25 foot right of way. So the applicant as part of the site plan application will be required to pave the road to those specifications um, when the site plan is approved. Okay, um, so then as a point of clarification, could you put the map back up that has the aerial view of the site? Sure. Please, I'm sorry. Not a problem. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a little unwieldy with multiple screens. Okay. I'm trying to go quickly. It's okay, okay. we're patient. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm looking at 133rd Road South, which is to uh, the top of the screen. Is this correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and the, the parcel that is in question is, is outlined in red, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so that's there are they responsible for just this portion uh the, their portion of 133rd road south and not the adjacent properties because because they would be responsible for the the dedication okay. of their property is that correct so they will be required to pave all the way up to um barwick road along uh -huh. that road but they are, are the only ones at this time that are required to dedicate the right of way uh should the property to the east of it develop they would also be subject to the same 25 foot dedication and then any of the other properties um as well um there is a home that's built out already on the corner there they um, could ask for a waiver if the 25 feet became unwieldy and but they would only be required to dedicate if the property was um redeveloped and i believe it's a 50 percent threshold um but there is no taking involved in any of this it's all as the road develops that way that it could be expanded to the 50 feet um ultimate right of way so am i looking at this map correctly that 133rd street 33rd road south almost dead end or it comes to an end at the end of this property line is that what I'm there's, seeing? There's one more house at the end of the block. One more house at the end of the block. So yes. we have this this from the end of their property line where they're required to do the dedication um, and the easement. Then that whole part of the road from that point to Barwick Road, although it may be repaved, would still be narrower. Am I understanding that correctly? Like they may get, make their part of the road wider to accommodate traffic, but the rest of that road until those lots on the, the either side develop or be sold or whatever happens to them, it will, they will remain as is. No, so for uh, public safety reasons, the road, the entire length of the road beginning at the west side of their property all the way up to Barwick would be uh, repaved at that 25 foot width because um, the engineering division didn't feel it was safe to have the roadway width change back and forth along the width of the road. So it wouldn't even be expanded to 50 feet until the right of way was available along the entire width of the road from the west property line up to Barwick. Yeah, and so it's, it's a very like long term kind of deal. I'd just like to interject something here too. Sure. Ms. Blankenship, if you Go come ahead. out to where 133rd meets Barwick Road, uh -huh. okay, and you go on the house as you're exiting 133rd on the right corner, which uh -huh. would be the um, southwest corner of Barwick and 133rd, that uh -huh. house, the garage of it is almost just a couple of feet off the property line. At, at the mouth of the road, that, that lot, as a magnificent single family home on it, it's not going to be redeveloped unless the place burned down. Right. And there's no room to widen the end of that road where it meets Barwick. Right. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. Like, I'm just not sure. How do we, then how do we get that 25 feet at the end of Barwick Road? I mean, we're not talking eminent domain or something like that, are we? Because that seems very problematic to me. No, it, it, here's what I, I mean, I drove back there and it's funny. Um, 
one of the applicants team remarked that he went back there on a piece of property and he drives a truck. And if two trucks were coming down the road, I drive a pickup truck a lot of mm -hmm. days. And I went to the property when I visited, I was driving a pickup truck and literally there was another car coming in and out. I had to back up and pull to the side of the road to get to a point where the road was wide enough for them to drive past. A 25 foot wide road, I mean, is, not, is, is, an, is an 18 wheel moving truck gonna go down that road? <laughs> yeah, but what about landscapers? Or okay, if we have, uh, the even if the, the amount of townhomes that he could build today, that the applicant could build today on that site, right. I'm still concerned that we wouldn't be able to functional, or the, the people that need to service that community would not be able to get in and out of that space no matter how many trips per day it was. We're talking landscaping vehicles and the garbage truck and the, I'm confused. I mean, it's just, it's always going to be a substandard roadway and access okay. until from getting from this site to Barwick Road. Now, I understand it's a site plan issue as ultimately, but I believe, I feel like it's up for us to discuss because it is part of a rezoning request to increase the density. Um, Absolutely. No, and, so, and you and I are just having a back and forth here. I want to involve yeah, yeah, I other know, members I of the board. I want to involve the other members of the board um, here. Okay. But I, um, I have to tell you, just off the bat, you and I share some of the same concerns. So okay. um, it's well, good I mean, hear. I won't belabor it. We've been here for a long time, so I'll, I'll just I'll just say that I will not be in support of recommending um, the rezoning to the city commission. And for all of the policies in the LDR that I originally <coughs> mentioned, with specifically LDR 3.2.2 and LDR 4.4.6, um, I won't be able to recommend approval to the commission. And I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Chip. Who's next? Mr. Chair. Wow. Um, this this parcel reminds me a little bit of what transpired in my neighborhood, which is uh, around 22nd and Swinton. Initially, uh, the um, the um, surrounding area is all single family homes, R1 AA, R1 AAA. Um, but initially, what was proposed for a five acre parcel there was um live work units and i think 45 dwelling units per acre uh that didn't go through so then a second development was proposed which was uh smaller single family homes that also failed and ultimately what prevailed was something within the existing ldrs and now there are really nice estate homes being built at a price tag of 2.4 million now granted that's a different area of the city than this is and i recognize that however i'd just like to say um, that this parcel when it was initially annexed um it was annexed in a way that um there could have been some um uh, there, there could have been single family there could have been medium density it, it left that up to flexibility given the current market conditions quite frankly i i wish there was a way to go back i recognize that legally that's that's not possible perhaps to do but i'd like to suggest to the owner and to the developer of this parcel that perhaps they might look at the surrounding single family homes, look at the strong neighborhood opposition, look at the conditions of uh, 133rd Road South, and perhaps even be able to design a project that would be more lucrative to them than the current one. For many reasons and a lot of, um, a lot of items in the comprehensive plan, the restrictive residential zoning district and um a number of other things i won't belabor I, I will not be in support of this rezoning thank you ms howell, thank you, ms. howell. mr zeller ms morrison mr long who's next <laughs> i'll make a quick comment um i'll keep it brief just because i don't want to be redundant um i'm probably not as vehemently opposed to this um as some of my other colleagues are um I'm a member of the Urban Land Institute and Sierra Club, actually. I read the, the myth and facts um, article that was sent. I thought it was very interesting. And, you know, I thought that um, Mr. Weiner, did, you know, he made some great points. And I'd love it if 
there were more areas in Delaware where we could fit more affordable housing. Because ultimately when we constrict it, we, we make it more expensive for folks. And I think there's a huge lack of housing stock here that is affordable to young families. And I think it's a huge problem. However, it's clear the infrastructure does not exist at this location to support that level of density. The access just doesn't doesn't work. That's that's evident. And so I do feel like as much as I would love to be able to support this project, um, it would be irresponsible to do so um, at this point. So that that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Well, Julia, Jul Julian laid out the arguments very succinctly. Um, I worked very hard on the always Delray uh, package, and I'm sure many of my colleagues on this call did too. And I really would like to uphold what we established in always Delray. And this project just doesn't do that. So I'm not in support. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Mr. Weinberg, Mr. Zeller. Yes. Um, I'm not in support of this project either for most of the same reasons as my colleagues have articulated, but in addition, I think that, um, you know, we have, we had the comp plan that was, that was adopted in, in February of 2020. There's been no changes in circumstances since that time. There's no change in, in, um, that area since that time. There are really no valid reasons based on the LDRs as were already cited to change the zoning. The, um, there's real, very real safety and traffic concerns that, that exist here. The, clearly this, the road 133 uh, road is not wide enough to accommodate um, traffic or even two-way traffic with with um, trucks and what have you. But I think that the applicant has has failed to prove by substantial confident evidence that, that this additional density that's requested is more appropriate for this property based upon the circumstances particular to this neighborhood. The staff report indicates that there, that none of the surrounding properties are, are uh, built to this density that that's requested. I think that safety would be uh, negatively impacted, that the requested changes create a substantial and negative impact to the stability of this neighborhood. <coughs> that the um, request is inconsistent, it said, as, as Blankenship said, any of the uh, uh, plan the R and the housing element as well as the LDR, and I think that and, uh, overall this would be a substantial panel change. I'm not impressed by these reports that Mr. Weiner read, the, the Sierra report, that's total hearsay. There's, that's not considered substantial evidence, and uh, he, he cites these cases by by uh, judges, but we don't know what the facts and circumstances are with regard to those decisions. So that's, that can't be considered substantial competent evidence. So all in all, um, my vote would be against this, this application. And thank you, Mr. Zeller. Thank you. Mr. Weinberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The issues uh, before us have been very well laid out. Um, the mobility element, the character of the neighborhood, which even if you look at the illustration on the screen, is largely single family. Uh, my colleagues on the board each have uh, succinctly, completely delineated uh, the reasons that this is uh, a project that can't be supported. And I would, I would be in accord with the uh, uh, with that uh, determination. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Um, since everybody's spoken, I'll just state that um, I've spent a lot of time looking at this uh, application and one of the uh, 
items that had the largest weight to me after I went and looked at the site and everything. And I think, um, Ms. Dasri, if I could ask you, could you go back to um, about eight slides back where you showed the entrance to Barwick Road? Sure, just a moment. Take your time. Um, but I was just going to say is that when I looked at the properties that are adjacent to the sea, you can see the house on the corner where that fence is right on the on the edge of the road, there's no way to do a dedication from that piece of property, <laughs> um, especially one that would be 25 feet. But um, what seemed to be was the properties that are still within the county that abut this are zoned low density, zero to five units per acre. This um, property already has received, how can I put it, um, a beneficial zoning in the fact that the zoning is 60% greater than would be allowed if this property was in, uh, if 60% if greater than what would be allowed in the county, even if they got five units of an acre, they now have eight. I just can't see, given the difficulties of this site, the ingress, the egress, that it would make sense for the city to uh, increase the density on this any further, let alone by 50%. So with that being said, I want to thank all my colleagues on the board um, for hanging together tonight. And if someone wants to make a motion, you did a great job, Ms. Blankenship, in explaining everything. I'll be happy Whoever to make the motion. To... Go ahead. There you go. Thank you so much. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, recommend denial of ordinance number 14-21, a privately initiated request to rezone 3.18 approximate acres located at 4652133 um, 133rd Road South from RM8 to RM, finding that the rezoning and approval thereof is not consistent with a comprehensive plan and does not meet the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Second by Ms. Morris and Ms. Miller, if you could please call the roll. Julie Hall? Yes. Alan Zeller? Yes to deny. Blankenship? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Rob Long? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Chris Davey? Yes. yes. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. You're welcome. Yep. Um, and with Mr. that, da Ms. Mr. Davy, could I just mention one thing before we go? Please, just, please just in case please. anybody anybody is still watching that offered public comment that didn't get heard tonight, um, we do appreciate. I, I think I speak for my colleagues on the board as well as the city that we appreciate your time and effort to call in, and we're very sorry that we couldn't hear everything. But your voice is important, and you know you can email too, and emails get read, and then. There's not a time limit to email. Just, but anyway, thank you so much, and thank you for letting me speak, Mr. Day. Oh, that's great sentiments, Ms. Blankenship. I'm sure myself and everybody else on the board echo them. A lot of people put in a lot of time to make phone calls, um, and we always want to encourage public participation in our local government. So with that, um, Ms. Alvarez, are you still here? I am still here, yes. <laughs> You're still here? Okay. <laughs> I'm ready for com I yeah. think we're ready for comments for you. We're and at, we're at comments. All right. Thank you all for a very good, thorough, and long meeting. Um, our next meeting is June 21st, and it is in person. So we'll be coming back into City Hall, and uh, we'll update you all as, as um, you know, if we know closer. of anything specific. Um, I guess just regarding any protocols that might be necessary or anything. But um, again, June 21st is our next meeting and we'll be in person. And um, that's all I've got at the moment. Just look for your agendas to be posted on June 11th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Mr. Bennett. I oh, just want to welcome Ms. Morrison back to um, her volunteer duties for the city. Uh, thank good you. to have you on planning and zoning. I um, just want to thank, thank everybody for, for a very efficient, very professional meeting tonight. Uh, made my job very easy. So I appreciate that. Um, just want to give you an update because we were talking about the bylaws earlier. Um, it is something we'll be uh, addressing sometime this summer. So it'll be uh, an item that should come up 
in the not so distant future. But that's it from us. Perfect. Mr. Bennett, thank you very much. Um, staff, thank you again as always. My colleagues on the board, hope everybody has a great Memorial Day and uh, I'll see you next month, if not sooner. Thank you, all. Thank you Mr. Good Beatty. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, meetings adjourned.